It often depends how far down the pathway you get before it becomes evident that the destination is not actually the goal. It is the journey. Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 586, with today's guest, Sensei Patrick McCarthy. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, <laughs> what we do, there we go, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you find everything we've got going on from our store, where you can make a purchase and support us, to the other projects, websites, things that we're funding and, and growing. And it's all in the name of supporting you, the traditional martial artist. This podcast gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out two times each and every week with the purpose of connecting, educating, and entertaining the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to support that work, there are a number of ways you can help. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend about us, pick up one of the books on Amazon, or support the Patreon. If you think the new shows that we're doing are worth a few cents, plus, you know, the fact that you get access to all the other stuff, plus the fact that if you throw in a couple bucks, we'll give you even more stuff that you don't get elsewhere, consider supporting the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's just one of the many ways that we're trying to cover our costs. There's a good chance that you know today's guest. You probably know his name, but if not, there's a good chance you know some of the work that he's done. As an author, translator, speaker, seminar presenter, organization head, he has been involved in the martial arts for a very, very long time. And our conversation is vast. We talked about a lot of things for a, quite a long time. If you haven't checked the length of this episode, well, guess what? You're in for a treat because it's kind of like we're giving you three episodes all at once. There are plenty of knowledgeable people out there. There are also plenty of people who enjoy speaking on their knowledge. But you don't have a lot of people who are really knowledgeable, able to speak at length about the things that they know and are passionate about and do so in an entertaining and educational way. Sensei McCarthy is that rare intersection. I hung out listening, as you will hear, for most of the episode in the same way that you will. My job as an interviewer is to get people to talk. I didn't have to work that hard on this one. And that was great, because it led to some absolutely wonderful stuff. I said, go, he went, and the result was an amazing experience that you get to be part of. One caution that you should be aware of, there are some explicit words in this episode, and we've elected to not censor it. So here we go. Hello, sir. How are you? Oh, good morning. I'm uh, actually, I should say good evening. How are you? Yeah, my morning or your morning, my evening. Yeah. Hey, may I ask you, where exactly are you? Sure. I'm in Vermont, East Coast. Okay. And I'm assuming that you have uh, a bit of snow over there right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have a bit of snow seven, eight months a year. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a beautiful part of the country, though, isn't it? It, it is. It is. It's, it's a wonderful place. And, and most important to me, the people. The people here will do anything for you. It's why I choose to live here. I haven't been over there in many, many years. But, you know, originally I'm from uh, New Brunswick. Uh, oh, I didn't know Just that. north of you, yeah. So Yeah. Um, and uh, we used to ski in Vermont. Uh, but look, at it, it's been, it's literally been, oh gosh, uh, 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Long time. Oh, what a trip. I, I've, I, I know people here who head out to New Brunswick oh, to go skiing. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of great skiing out there. That's great. So now, uh, it's, oh, okay. So we're, th this is uh, audio only, no... no. Uh, yeah, audio only. We, we, can, we can wander around. Part of my process, I, I tend to meander and mm. pace back and forth mm. and step back from the microphone yep. when you're talking. And Good. We get to do all those fun things and That's great. not worry about where we're looking. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. It's easier. Yeah. easier to edit. Good. So I, I, we, I guess we're starting, we start, oh, God, it's eight o'clock now. We start soon or are we... Well, it's not live, so we can start whenever. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm, you know, okay, great. Yeah. That's even easier. You know, one of, 
we we have we have a decision we can make at this point. Mm. We can just go mm. and see where it takes us, yeah. or I can kind of put a hard stop on what we've already said, and and we can we no. can have an intro thing. But no. I've got the feeling that you're you're good to go. <laughs> you're a pro. You <laughs> you know what you're doing. You know, there's a there's a great quote. Uh, I, I suppose maybe a metaphor more than a quote uh, about Winston Churchill uh, just in the post-war years, you know, and uh, he was asked to speak. Uh, look, I believe it was the Geneva Convention, maybe. Yeah. He sa- he asked the organizer, he said, how long would you like me to speak for? And the organizer looked at me and said, I'm sorry, what, what do you mean? He says, well, my good man, he says, if you'd like me to speak uh, for an hour, I'll need uh, I'll need a few days to prepare. If you'd like me to speak for two hours, I'll just need a day or so. But if you'd like me to speak all night, I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of, uh, is it is it the Mark Twain quote? I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. Very nice. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm ready to go. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, let's just, let's, let's, just keep, let's just keep going. So, you know, the... I think right off the bat, you know, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Can I, can I just is, ask you a question? I'm so, yeah. so sorry. And you can edit. This yeah, like, go for it. How exactly did we arrive at this uh, interview? Uh, you, well, you, you've been, I, I've been aware of you. Mm. And we, so this show and Whistlekick in general, it's not just me. There, there are others who can contribute. I looked you up. You, on you this have process. hundreds and hundreds of interviews. Yeah. Yeah. You are scheduled to be 586. <laughs> sir. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. That's Thank you. Fantastic. You know, it, I, I, I try to apply the, the martial arts methodology to anything, which is be really bad at it for a long, long time. <laughs> And then wait until everybody else stops doing it. And then you get to be okay. And in comparison, people actually think you're really good because nobody else has put in the time to be really, really bad. <laughs> well, look at I, and, and with all, all due respect, uh, I've never heard of your, you know, I've never heard of your program. And, and then I, and I, uh, when your colleague contacted me and I said, yeah, sure. I just want to kind of vet you first and see where, and then, and then I asked another friend of mine, he said, well, you've never heard of them? I went, no. He said, my God, you go to the website. And I went, I, I must have spent three hours on your website just oh, fun. looking through Thank and you. listening to some of the interviews. They're absolutely fantastic. And, and um, yeah, you're, go- you're going to be, <laughs> you've automatically become one of our favorite uh, stops for people in my group to go and listen. And it's just, oh, just so, it's, it's just a wealth of information. God, you've had such a pantheon of, uh, of, yeah. um, and not necessarily champions. I mean, you know, I, you don't need to speak to a champion to get good news, you know. And, and you, my God, you've got every every traditional, contemporary, eclectic. Uh, it, it's all there. So, congrats to you. Well, thank you, thank you. And and uh, let me respond to that, and then I'll answer your question. I I, I can already tell this is going to be fun because you know <laughs> we're. There, there's nothing. There's been nothing linear about anything either of us has said in the last few minutes. So I'm I'm super excited. I believe strongly that martial arts context, the stories, the history, the lineage, the spirit, all of that is so relevant. It matters so much, and it is the part that the individuals will ignore the most of themselves. A a martial arts instructor will teach their students maybe where they come from, technique, kata, uh, sparring, you know, all all the stuff. But they'll leave out, well, the reason they started training and who they trained with and why they trained and their own personal story, which gives so much depth. And I, I feel it's really important that we chronicle that. And I think this format works well. We've had several guests who have passed away no. and those stories now stand and yeah, their yeah. families and their students get to hear them as they were in that moment, that day. And, mm. and I think, I think that's meaningful. And, and, you know, we, we release every episode for free. You don't have to pay anything ever mm. to get access to mm. any of them. And, mm. and I've always said, feel free to distribute as much as you want, as long as they stay in entirety. If you want to chop it up, I, I want to review yeah. what you're doing. But if you're just putting exactly. it out there somewhere, yeah. by all means, do it. Sure. Yeah. Well, you and know. So to look, answer I, your question, why, <laughs> why, you know, how did this happen? 
um, I, I believe it was Andrew said, why haven't, why hasn't McCarthy since he been on the show? And I said, you know, I can't answer that. And he said, well, let's fix that. And so we did. You know, I, I, well, first there, of all, there are okay. just a lot of great people to talk to and <laughs> following those paths out and, and getting the connections and building up the show enough that people such as yourself will say yes. You know, that takes time. Well, I've, 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 I've only listened to five interviews, so sorry. I'm, 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 so it's obvious I have like 547. <laughs> How dare you? Know. How dare you? Well, look, you know, look, just I, before we even get to this whole martial art thing, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I'm a, a very good uh, a visual learner, you know, from a pedagogical point of view. And I've never, I don't know, I, I, I just, I've never really placed much emphasis. I'm sorry, I'm speaking as a, as a younger man, I never really had placed a lot of emphasis on the auditory part, you know, listening. And, and you know, mm -hmm. often when you're a kid, you're so busy doing other things, you don't tend to listen too much, even to your parents and so on. But, um, oh, some, some years ago, I came into contact with, uh, a television series called the actors workshop and um yeah look not that i'm an actor or I, or I suppose all of us are actors in some way or another um and i and and the very first episode i uh, bumped into let's say uh, accidentally accidentally maybe was uh, an interview with charles heston and 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 this mm -hmm. um but the, so the interviewer ran a uh literally you know uh, was part of a college in new york and and he and he and he trained actors, you know, and and, uh, and part of this uh, uh, program was to bring on, you know, Hollywood A-listers, I guess, you know, once a month or at least certainly once an episode, you know, and it was in an auditorium and they'd sit down, and just, you know, kind of with the, you know, armchairs at 45 degree angles to each other and a cup of coffee or, or, or a refreshment. And um uh, he just said, you know, tell me your story and, 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 and would ask questions. And he was very famous at the end for asking the 10 famous questions. You know, how do you respond to these? And, you know, he'd shoot them out and, and you'd have to answer them kind of like on the spot. And uh, for me, I love, I love uh, uh, you know, movies. And um, uh, not compared to books, but second to that. I, I love that whole visual thing. And so I sat and listened to uh, Charlton Heston speak. And um, now, you know, Charlton Heston was one of the last, you know, I want to say, uh, classical trained actors, you know, methodical actor trained. And, um, you know, back during the day when Hollywood had very tight grip on its uh, on its A-listers, you know, there was, you, you know, you were told which parties you were going to go to and who to be with and who, you know, all that type of thing. And you know there was there were some famous issues between Charles Heston and, and some of the other A-listers that he hated working with. But when the interviewer asked him the questions, it was every time Charles Heston responded to the question, it was always he, he always had something positive to say. And in spite of you knew you knew, I mean, if you didn't know the issue, you would have never guessed. But you, especially knowing there were issues between he and particularly. Uh, female leading roles, uh, where he had, you know, where they were uh, considered divas, and and he uh, he just he was so polite and he was so uh, forthcoming, um, but always sought to uh, display his uh, concern or opinion in a very positive and progressive way. And I said, that, that, that's an art, you know. That's an art. And and I speak a lot, you know. And I, I and you know I travel around the world and teach a lot of seminars and have for oh gosh, oh since 1993. And um, I know that the power of word is uh, can be um, can really influence people within your range of uh, speaking. And so I just think very hard about how should I. How should I voice my opinion on a particular thing and protect the listener from my own bias, you know? And I thought there's no other, you know, you're, you're always looking for ways with which to kind of make yourself better. You know, that's that, that kind of Kaizen that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, trying to constantly, you know, improve yourself. If only just a little bit, you know, even if it's a couple of steps forward and one step back type of thing, you know, you want to be, 
you want to try at least the effort is there to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday. And listening to guys like Heston and, and that, uh, that program, the Actors Workshop, gave me an idea. So I found every one of those episodes and I downloaded them and I listened to them. And now I haven't listened to them in quite a while. But it would be a odd time I will go back and say, oh, yeah, I want to go back and listen to what Michael Keaton said. I want to go back and listen to what Dinah Shore said. Or, you know, I want to go back and listen to what one of these guys said. Because, you know, as you mentioned, it's it's kind of like that uh, <clears throat> that, 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 that samurai cherry blossom uh, metaphor, you know, where, where um, you know, life is not as long as most people think it is. And, mm-hmm. and, and people who reach the top of their game may only stay there for a little while. It's like the cherry blossom mentality. You know, they they burst out into a, an array of beauty and it doesn't last long before they fall off the branch type of thing. And, and, and the samurai, of course, was the same. The, that warrior mentality was to live gloriously uh, knowing that, uh, your, that, that your demise was going to be the highlight of your, of your life. And I thought, you know, the more I can read or listen to other people speak like that, the, the greater understanding I can have of what brings us together. And that's where I came up. I, that's where I, I really targeted my interest on a, a one particular guy. I first heard it from a German um, philosopher who, who came to Japan a very long time ago. His name was Eugene Hergel. And, um, you know, he was... he. Um, he was in search of wanting to study the fighting arts, uh, and he found uh, he, he found himself uh, through the connection with the Zen and his practice. And where I used to live up in I'm down in Okinawa now, but I used to live up in Kanagawa Prefecture in a little town called Fujisawa, and uh, there was a <clears throat> there was a just you know about an eight or nine minute train ride from me. There's a uh, there's a, t- a temple in Kita Kamakura called uh, the Enkakuji, and um, uh, we used to go down there because there was a, a stone monument uh, dedicated to Funakoshi Gichin, one of the one of the pioneers of modern karate. And it said, as it said, it reads, you know, karate ni sen. And I said, there's no first uh, attack in in karate, but but to, in order to get to the stone monument, you have to walk by the uh, the archery range where uh, Eugene Herigl used to lob arrows uh, as in, in his pursuit for better understanding Zen, you know. And his bow still hangs up on that dojo wall to serve as a visual, a visual reminder of the pathway and the, the journey that he, that, that took him from his home in Germany to, uh, uh, to Japan. And I, and I like that because because it it, it 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 kind of helps with that whole Zen simplicity thing, you know, less is more, and and understanding the the value of living in harmony with nature, and, and all of these yeah. types of things that kind of give you a peacefulness to you know understanding how a life is best lived, and likening this, I guess, mentality or philosophy or mindset to a, a pathway. It often depends how far down the pathway you get before it becomes evident that the destination is not actually the goal. It is the journey. And whatever, you know, for example, let's say myself now in, in, in the role as a mentor uh, to many other uh, younger students and learners, is what better thing can you offer someone than the, um, the benefit of your wisdom or your experience, that your experience has, has given you over the years, if only in a, in a guiding uh, mindset. You know, I think you can, you can, you can tell people anything, but you can't make anyone do anything. And I think the idea of showing somebody perhaps how to learn seems to be more fruitful in the long run than telling or explaining or offering what to learn, you know? And I think that role for yeah. for a teacher or mentor or guide or you know whatever you want to call it you know if you're trying to empower someone it's um it's kind of nice to you know let them discover for themselves uh you know with a little bit of uh coaching if I can use that word uh as to what what the outcome might be by pursuing this particular uh, practice. And I always, I, you know, and certainly as a teacher, I've learned over the years that there is a complete difference between learning, 
practice and training. And, you know, many years ago, I was, uh, I was still living here in Japan, off of the mainland. And, and there was, a uh, <laughs> funny, well, actually it was 1993. And, uh, I got a, I got a job offer from here in Okinawa. And the job offer was very interesting. It was a guy. It was a. It was a. He was. He had been very successful as a, as a, dev- a land developer. You know, a, a real estate a, a broker, and um, and he loved karate, and he had this. Um, he had this idea that you know, um, karate, uh, which was one arm of uh, budo. You know, the the uh, uh, modern fighting arts of Japan. You know, others being kendo judo. And so on, sure. that it could serve as a um, let's call it a mechanism in principle, a mechanism uh, with which to empower people, uh, but more importantly, uh, particularly with foreign people. And you know, Okinawa uh, has an extremely large foreign presence here, and mostly, as you know, is American military here, which which uh, since 1945 have. Uh, have occupied, I think it's about one third of the island. I could be wrong on that, okay? But it's a, it's a very large part. You know, they have several bases uh, all over the island. And, and um, so this idea that karate could serve as a, as a, a, a mechanism to bridge the two cultures together. You know, the West doesn't understand the Eastern mind implicitly. And, and of course, you know, the East does not understand the, the Western mind implicitly, and, and you've got the kind of, you've got the merge and the meeting of two minds, the Western mind and the Eastern mind, and one is based largely in conformity and groupthink, you know, let's call them the board. <laughs> and the other one is the yardstick we tend to use to measure our value is individuality, independence, and, uh, you know, and um, they're both at opposite ends of the spectrum uh, with regards to, uh, you know, being in the fighting arts and here in Japan. And so, the idea that uh, you know, you think, well, what, what, if I, if, if the fighting arts uh, could be a microcosm, um, what in fact would it represent from a cultural point of view? It could represent the, uh, certainly, you know, the cultural landscape, the social mindset, and the etiquette and the formalities, and even the language, you know, for example. Mm-hmm. And so that by embrace for a foreign person to come to the country, or not necessarily come to the country, but to embrace this cultural practice in their own culture, opened a doorway to better understanding something about another culture. And in learning more about another culture, you invariably come to learn a little bit more about yourself. And once captured by that essence, if I can say, use a word of introspection, because, you know, every pathway, irrespective of whether it's uh, classical or contemporary, eclectic or traditional, you know, has got to condition the body, uh, cultivate the mind, and nurture the spirit. And, And the only other thing that I find the most of the world argue over is the functionality of their practices, you know. And so, you know, I, you know, and I guess you probably already looked into my past. There's, you know, I've kind of done it all, you know. You know, started out in, the, you know, in judo and, and then went into karate. And, and, you know, I had this passionate love affair with, uh, you know, Japanese culture. And um, this whole uh, uh, idea about the warrior mindset, you know, Certainly later, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, cultural anthropologists was uh, Joseph Campbell. And um, I guess, you know, you don't even have to be an anthropologist to know who he was. You know, 60 books later, my favorite, of course, being Hero with a Thousand Faces. But, you know, you, you get a guy like a cultural anthropologist, what the hell is he doing with a guy named George Lucas at Skywalker Ranch, uh, brainstorming on how uh, they would portray uh, an actor in a movie called Star Wars? Uh, and uh, Darth Vader <laughs> would take on the characteristics of a samurai because Joseph Campbell imparted an important lesson to George Lucas. And a lot of people don't know that. They don't hear about stuff like that. But, you know, once again, venturing outside my, uh, my uh, as I say, my comfort zone, you know, I started to realize, well, wow, there's a little bit more to learn than just punching or kicking. And there's this wonderful uh, in Japanese, we say koto waza. And koto waza means a proverb or old saying, you know. And um, 
It goes onko chishin. And onko chishin means, uh, basically it just means uh, if you take the time to investigate, study, explore, evaluate the past or the old or basically the origins of something, you can better understand why and how it is the way it is today. And particularly with regards to which forces affected its growth and direction with regards to understanding where it's going to go in the future. And uh, so this idea of looking at the historical evolution of a particular practice, you know, certainly brings you into contact with its dynamics and understanding, um, you know, um, why it is the way it is and why is it another way, you know. And so anyway, I, uh, you know, I just, just a quick uh, jaunt. Let me just uh, digress for a second. You know, start out in judo, go uh, accidentally fall into karate. This is during the 1960s. And then, of course, you know, the Bruce Lee craze, everybody jumped on the Kung Fu bandwagon. And then there, 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 then there was the ninjas, and there were Kobudo, and then there was uh, Richard uh, Chamberlain in, in the, you know, the the Shogun uh, television series. So I took up a sword after that and wore the Hakama. And, Hello, oh, 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 I was going to learn a little bit of Japanese. And then, of course, you know, there was the big jujitsu craze and, uh, you know, in, in, you know, growing up in Canada, I had wonderful opportunity to meet uh, Professor Wally J as a kid, you know, and so on, and, and, and you know, go down the jujitsu road, and and then you know, in high school, I I uh, was a very passionate about uh, you know freestyle wrestling and college wrestling, and, and boxed and kickboxed, and and had a you know an early mentor of mine in Toronto was. Um, Wally Slokey was one of the greats, you know, put the, put Canada on the map for kickboxing back after Mike Anderson's first PK uh, uh, event in September 74 when you know, guys like, you know, uh, Joe Lewis and Bill Wallace and uh, Benny and all those guys, get, you know, became yeah. the, uh, the so-called world champions, you know. And then, and then and, you know, and then finding myself in Japan in, in the mid-1980s, uh, married uh, uh, with <laughs> a child on the way, and uh, you know, a bun in the oven, and uh, no job, and <laughs> no, you know, no possibility of getting work. And I, you know, and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I, I, I somebody gave me this opportunity to, <clears throat> excuse me, to give a demonstration up at a place called St. Mary's College, a private uh, school in in um, in Tokyo, you know, and. Uh, Anyway, I did the demonstration, and, and this guy comes up to me, and he goes, hey, man, wow, he said, uh, you're really, who are you? Like, you're really good. And, and I went, oh, hey, thank you very much. I have more. And he said, do you like fighting? I said, oh, yeah, I'm certainly not enough of it, but I'm you know, kind of retired, married, living here, looking for a job. You have a job? He goes, I don't have a job. But he said, if it's money you need, we, I, I have, you know, I'm I'm involved with this uh, fight uh, 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 tour, if you will. It's uh, you know we, we're in Hokkaido, we're in Honshu, you know we're down in uh, in Kyushu. You know we travel around the country setting up cards. It's just a small team of us guys, and you know we take on all kinds of different you know all comers. And I went, does it pay money? He goes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Minimum three hundred thousand yen uh, per fight. Uh, now in those days, a hundred thousand yen was approximately. Fifteen hundred bucks. So if I was getting three hundred thousand, you do the math, and I was going, "Wow, that's." I said, "I'm in," <laughs> and he and he said, "You know, he said, win or lose." He said, "It's just kind of a salary for our fighters." <clears throat> and I went, "I'm in, <clears throat> I'm in." I didn't ask what the rules were. I didn't really care to tell you the truth. I, was, I just said, "But that's like that's a whole month's salary in one fight." I said, "You know, I used to work in the door of clubs. You know, it was a oh, clubs. I'm being very nice by calling them clubs. They're like like dumps. There's what they're watering all these <laughs> bikers and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, I was getting twenty bucks a night. All I could drink." All the fights you can get into, all the telephone numbers you can pick up, you know. So, so for for five thousand dollars, I, I didn't care. And anyway, it was uh, the guy's name was Gene Pelk, and he was the uh, vice president of, of Marvel Com uh, comic books in Japan. By the way, are, are a phenomenon. And in those days, uh, a weekly, a, a weekly they call it magna, you know, uh, was the size of an old yellow page. Uh, 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 you know, do you remember the telephone books, the big thick telephone books back in the day? Oh, sure. Try teaching your kids what that means, by the way, these days. <laughs> and um, and uh, they were huge like that, and they were weekly. And there was, you know, all kinds of different sections. And there was, you know, everything you could possibly imagine were in those things. And uh, 
And and by the way, Gene Pep was also the the co-founder of uh, him and um, oh, you're gonna have to help me now. Who's the who's the guy who uh, did all the Marvel comic books? Uh, uh, he just passed Stan away. Lee? Stan Stanley Stan. And he and Stan were. Uh, best of friends. And in fact, sorry, I'm just digressing again. I'm like you, seven of this, seven directions on this horse. Um, I love it. They're, the Japanese are just doing a, a documentary right now on Gene Pelk about his mm. um, untold, uh, his untold story in Marvel Comics, by the way, and his development of Spider-Man and stuff like that. But look, that's a different story. Gene says to me, he goes, he goes, okay, he says, uh, you know, here's the address. Be down at this gym. You know, you, you only got a week before the fight, and you're going to get in shape. I said, well, I'm already pretty fit, you know. But he goes, no, no, he says, it's a bit different. The rules are a bit different. I'm like, okay. So I show up at this place, and the guy's name is uh, uh, Sayama. Satoru is his name. He's just a little guy. You know, he's pretty solid, but kind of a little guy. And I, and I went... Um, Okay, yeah, nice to meet you. know, Here's my name. I so-and-so recommended me. Can you teach me? You know, and he goes, sure. And there was, I saw there was a bunch of other guys and they were like, they had no gear on and they had like a kind of leotard, fancy leotard pants and, uh, and they were beating the heck out of each other. And I was going, what the hell is this? And they pick a guy and throw him and pounce on him and pound him in the face. I was like, Jesus, what? This is like street fighting. And he goes, oh, shoot all. Shoot all this kid. I'm going to shoot all. And what I couldn't understand was shoot though. What the hell is shoot all? You know? And then Gene's son, Ted Pelk, who, who actually I just had coffee with a couple months ago in Tokyo, who's still involved with him, by the way, Said, ah, uh, and who, who's uh, born in Japan, uh, mother's Japanese, father's, you know, American, and, uh, and who, so she, she's perfectly bilingual. He says to me, he goes, oh, he said, you know, the Japanese have a, have a, have difficulties pronouncing R's and L's and ING's. He, what he means to say is shooting. And I went, shooting? He goes, yeah, he said, in Japanese, a shoot means a throw. And I went, oh, well, what the hell are they doing here? He says, he says, oh, he said, um, Sayama used to be a Muay, Muay Thai fighter and a professional wrestler. And, um, you know, he had some problems with the Yakuza and blah, 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 blah. So he decided to create his own concept for fighting and they call it shoot fighting. Now, okay, well, let's give it a go. You know, my, my mind was so focused on the money that I just, okay. Anyway, long story short, as I get in the ring and I, <laughs> I get the shit beaten out of me. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and I really, honestly, I really, you know, when I say shit, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I just like, I'd never, I, I'd never, first of all, I've never fought Thai rules before, even as a kickboxer in Canada, I was always doing the North American stuff. So there were never, never any leg kicks back in the seventies, you know, and, and, and early eighties. So, uh, unless you were fighting international Thai rules, right. And which I never did. And, uh, so I didn't know how to check a thigh kick and, uh, and, and, and the, this first guy I fought, uh, just, as soon as he realized that I didn't know how to check a, 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 a thigh kick, man, he, he banged me four or five times. And then, and then, you know, by the time I was getting a little bit, uh, you know, my leg was getting a little bit sensitive. I made the stupid mistake of kind of putting my arm down and block the kick. And he came up high with a kick and slammed me in the face with his shin. And, and, you know, while I was, you know, counting how many loops were around Jupiter there, he shot in and, and did a double leg takedown um mounted me and and submitted me basically and i'll never never forget that and that, but so i was kind of i was kind of like i was like wow what the hell was that and when am i going to get my money <laughs> and so so what it did is it just opened up the door for me to enter through to learning something new uh, that i hadn't and look and we didn't stay long at simon's place because he really was he really was massive disco you know uh and and a, and a group of the guys left and went over and formed. There was one guy's name was Caesar Takeshi. He created a, a a kind of a subsidiary group called Shoot Boxing. I tried that too. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to grapple with boxing gloves on, though. You know, those leotard pants. So I so I, anyway, had a couple of those fights and uh, and then uh, one of the original guys. Oh, there was a few of them. Maida Akira. He broke away and he formed a group called Rings. And the, guy, the group that I went with was a guy named Takara Nobuhiko. And they formed a group called the UFI. 
the United Federation of Wrestlers International. And uh, and so th- there I was. I, I was now becoming a, a shoot fighter submission wrestler. And I got to tell you, I probably learned more about karate with these guys who knew nothing about karate, by the way, uh, than I did from any karate instructor. Because one of the things that seemed to be lacking most in the karate training, and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I came up with, I came up under the, under the uh, auspices of some pretty tough guys, you know, from very strong fighters. But as a rule, generally speaking, from a functional point of view, karate, and I, my mind wanders back to the very early 70s, 71, two, three, around there, when Bruce Lee's uh, claims of, you know, rid yourself from the classical mess and, you know, overly ritualized, uh, dysfunctional practices, gonna get you hurt in a real fight. And uh, so with that kind of echoing in the background, I'd always, you know, I had this wonderfully passionate love affair going on with, you know, Japanese culture, the simplicity of Zen, the warrior mindset. The only problem was it was that the training didn't fit the function, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, you'll look at some of these classical demonstrations and, uh, and you, you know, a um, case in point was uh, every year in in Tokyo. There's a, you know, there's a long calendar of different uh, classical martial art demonstrations that you can go see at the Budokan and the Meiji Shrine and so on and so forth. And and, um, and uh, one day I was sitting in the Budokan. And I was actually demonstrating with my own group. I I, I'm, I used to practice swordsmanship as well. And our sword group was going to be demonstrating there. And then it was, it's an all day long thing. You know, and I was sitting up in the uh, audience uh, with my wife, and you know we had a little obento, you know, a little snack, and watching the demonstrations. And, and this group beside me was going, "Oh my God, did you see that?" And you know, it was like, "Oh, because you must have met that on." And I went, "Yeah, you know, what do you, you know, what, what, what is that that you found so exciting? Did you see that little guy when all those guys attacked him? He he just held him down with one finger." And I went, "Yeah, well." Are you clapping for the guy who did that or all the, all the attackers who attacked them with the technique they were supposed to? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, I mean, the, you know, the attackers coming in with a pre-ordained technique and he, he's not meant to really hit him in the first place. And, you know, he's going to do this and this and loop around and hold him there while he kicks the other guy. And, you know, it's all, it's all you know, it's, it's a preset demonstration. No, no, it's not. That, that's real. And I'm like, oh goodness, it's interesting. You know, you know, <laughs> being in the martial arts since childhood, you kind of know the difference between what is you know prescribed and and what's freestyle. You know, and, and anything that's usually freestyle is pretty messy and, and and not not typically nice to look at at all. You know, and I said, no, 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 that, that's uh, you know, that's uh, no, 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 and I and I I, I could not convince the girl. That it wasn't prescribed, and and so and and that is very widespread throughout the classical martial arts, and that's exactly what Lee was talking about. You know, was and that's great. You know, when you embrace a fighting art for its culture as a cultural recreation, and let's say you know a pathway just for you know enjoying the journey, because you know, you know, as I said earlier, you you want whatever your pathway is, you want something that's going to help keep you healthy all your life. Something that you know keeps the weeds from growing in your brain, and, and and you know something that puts you in touch with something that's not easily understood, something spiritual, you know, not 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 religious, not you know, not attaching politics to spiritualism, but you know, just so that there's something greater than yourself uh, in the world, you know, and uh, and and that's an absolute necessity, and it doesn't matter what you practice. Uh, it, 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 I mean, if you're practicing it for your for life. You know, um, you know, you're not training like an Olympic athlete. That's some type of uh, activity that's, uh, you know, by the time you're in your mid twenties, you're burned out. You know, so high intensity type stuff. And so the only one thing that's missing, I, I thought, was this was an was a practice that linked um, unprescribed or unpredictable acts of physical violence into a method of being able to um, receive that or embrace that uh, attack and be able to effectively negotiate it irrespective of what it was. And the beauty about being around these guys, uh, this and by the way, our group went 
we changed our name ultimately from Mutavi to Pride. We became known as the Pride Fighters. And then we brought lots of lots of foreigners to Japan to fight. There's all kinds of, there's lots of history about that now, uh, yeah. about uh, how it's a, we... It's a, fam- it's a famous group. Yeah, yeah, oh, sure. You know, Baz Rutten and, and it was, yeah. so we, we, we brought a lot of guys over to fight who then found their own way uh, through... You know, through shoot fighting, submission wrestling, of course, and of course, you know, although, although, the, although, uh, I doubt that Dana White would, uh, would, would, uh, agree with this because it's, <laughs> it's not supporting his business, you know, but lo- long before the UFC, long before the Gracies ever, you know, came up with, uh, uh, with the, with the, you know, the octagon, excuse me, Bruce, uh, sorry, I was just choking on a movie called The Octagon there with, uh, with uh, Chuck Norris. Sorry. Long before, uh, pun intended, uh, you know, long before the UFC uh, came to be, uh, there was a whole group of warriors battling it out with, uh, that were, that should be more recognized as being the, the fathers of MMA. I mean, and, and you know, that, that, that arguably could go back to Enter the Dragon or it could go even back further to, you know, we had uh, guys like uh, Diki Dozan and uh, Kimura and Maida here in Japan back in the 50s. Uh, you remember, you remember, uh, or had you heard that, you know, back in the 50s, you know, uh, uh, boxing was rivaled by professional wrestling. And a lot of people who look at professional wrestling today, they kind of shake, uh, you know, who are, who are uh, advocates of, you know, say MMA, for example, or, uh, who consider that real fighting. You know, there's no rules and regulations. There's, it's real fighting. Um, they look back at professional wrestling, they kind of laugh. Oh, that's, a, that's a joke. Haystack, Calhoun, and the Sheik, and Giant Baba, you know. But, but what they don't know is that back in the early days, you know, this, this kind of catch wrestling mentality is, is very, very old. And, you know, back during the days of the steamships where, you know, where ships that were engineered by steam started linking foreign cultures together and they had different classes on board the boats and, and, uh, you know, down there on third class, you know, you always had, you know, the strong man or, you know, the woman with the beard and, uh, you know, hey, if anybody could uh, drop this wrestler or this fighter, they got five dollars or a nickel or, you know, and, 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 and that wrestling was a very, very popular thing. And, and, um, you know, there's, uh, I, when I was, uh, teaching out in Estonia one year and, uh, in, uh, uh, and outside the hotel I was staying and there was a bust, a bust of a, of a famous wrestler. And I went, oh my God, look at this guy. And his name was Jan Karantel and, and, uh, massive guy and, 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 and his epithet reads, uh, had not been on his back in 5,000, 5,000 fall, uh, 5,000 bouts. But I would, you know, I started looking into that history of, you know, the catch wrestling and, and I'll make this point in a minute, but you know, all the joint lock, pressure point, takedown, strangulation, throws, grappling groundwork, anything that you can possibly think of has already been done long before by these guys, you know, and this, and the, 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 this ancient uh, practice uh, at one time, used to be featured on steamships traveling from one culture to another. And, you know, some of these guys like Tani and Uyahara and, and, um, and Mr. O'Brien and people like that were famous for, you know, uh, you see a little guy like Yukio Tani was very small little Japanese guy. And, and um, you know, big, strong foreigners would come in and try to uh, throw him to the mat. And, and, of course, he was a jiu-jitsu expert, you know. And they would find themselves on the back, in the back, and I, and I just, I, I, I kind of uh, opened this new love affair with, uh, with um, up close and hands-on uh, application practices, and and um, and sometimes in the, you know, and, and as I said, we kind of, uh, and by the the gym was called or the, the dojo, if you will, it was called a snake pit in Tokyo, and uh, which is still exists today, by the way, and it's actually run by one of our former. Um, seniors there. Uh, his name is Miyato, by the way. And um, now they knew nothing about karate at all. You know, and my whole life was, you know, karate. And I was doing all this other stuff just, you know, for money and, 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 you know, the thrill and excitement of challenge and so on. And, but, and, you know, even when I took up swordsmanship, it was, it was really to better understand this empty handed thing, you know. And um, the funny part about it was uh, 
you know, they they would do their road work in the morning and then all come back and have a big. It was like a, it was like they were it was like they were uh, Aborigines uh, uh, from the jungles of Southeast Asia. You know, and they'll come home together. They had this big, huge uh, metal pot with stuff they would throw in it all day. Some fresh chicken, some veggies, and you know, they'd all eat from that at night, like like a sumo stable. You know, and and you know, there, there was a weight training, there was their stretching, there was their rolling, and there was their bag impact, percussive impact practice. And then at the odd time at night, I'd see them up in the ring, you know, and they they'd be going through just movements, you know. And I would say in Japanese, I say, "Sumimasen, ano chutto." You know, hey, wow. Um, hey, you guys are doing kata? Is that a kata you're doing? And their, uh, their response would be back to me. We go, koto chito you know, I'm sorry, what, what do you mean? What's a kata? And I go, those moves you're doing, that looks like a kata from a karate kata. And they go, young. Um, uh, they, they say, no, no. I'm just, um, I'm just rehearsing my escapes and my counters. And I'll tell you, just right at that moment, I just had this, like, you know, you, you call it an epiphany. I call them the BFOs, the blinding flash of the obvious. I just went, no, it can't be that simple. Now, I'm going to take you back to where we started this conversation. You know, in, in, and I oversee an organization and, and you know, we're, we're worldwide, we're like in 35 countries and, and, you know, we have a, uh, you know, classical and contemporary and, uh, you know, uh, we, we have a kind of an old version of modern karate. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. And, and, uh, we have a jujitsu practice. We have a sword fighting practice as well, you know, and, uh, so a lot of, uh, not a lot, but uh, some parts of our group. They don't do the classical stuff. They they like the uh, they like the uh, jujitsu part of what we do. It's called Aiki Kempo Jujitsu, and they like part of what we do in the sword school. I, I teach a you know a, 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 a tension show in Katori Shintobi, or so I should say parts of it. <laughs> but I'm not telling the Katori Shintobi people that they'll get upset with me. And uh, and so um, so so my guys will take some of the say the stick let's call it the stick or the cane from the sword and and they like it with the the, the stand up the clinch and the ground part of the jujitsu and they just kind of train with just shorts and a, and a rash guard you know so call it call it whatever you want and um so so my one of my main schools in brisbane had two different training parts and often to get to one training part, you had to kind of walk through the other training part, right? And so when the so when the guys who do like the modern type, of, you know, the, let's let's call it MMA for the lack of a better word, would walk through the dojo, they say they'd see, you know, some of our kata application going on. They say, oh, oh, you're finally doing the real stuff. <laughs> and I'd say, I'd say, yeah, you know, I'm not sure about that, you know. And um, and uh, so when I would go to teach seminars, and uh, it, many people who uh, um, hired me to come and teach uh, were exclusively bringing me for kata application practices, you know. And, uh, you know, there's this invariable uh, um, um, sense of belonging and ownership, you know. If I practice that particular school or style or methodology, then of course it must be the best, right? And, and uh, there's that inalienable right to believe that what it is you're doing is the best type of thing, you know. Because if there was something that was better, you'd probably go and do that, right? And, um, I would say, uh, you know, look, I'm not that particular style. I'm not Shoto, Shido, Watogoju. I'm not in those styles. I'd like to, I'd like you to imagine for a moment, you know, if we could take a little, uh, a walk back through history, you know, let's, uh, let's pretend it's the Christmas Carol and I'm Scrooge and I'm, t I'm the ghost of Christmas past and I'm taking you through to show you the past. And, you know, 50 or 75 years ago, you might only had one or two styles of karate. And then a hundred years ago, you know, you had no styles of karate and 150 years uh, ago, you, you know, all you had was, uh, you know, garrisons or, or, or places with which, uh, to learn how to be functionally effective either on the battlefield or in the arena or just in life itself, you know. And if you had a, if, if, I don't know, if, if someone was in charge of mentoring another person to be effective in self-defense but didn't know how to fight on the ground or or or, or it fully dressed or, or, or how to 
you know, uh, protect himself against percussive impact or, or being clinched or, 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 or fighting in a telephone booth or in a bar or something like that, then that would be the weakest link on their chain. And so I, I would say, look, by virtue of the fact that, and we're only talking about self-defense now, we're not talking about, you know, uh, in, in the cage or in the ring or the arena or on the battlefield, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, self-defense where, where it's, it's not somebody coming up and going, hey, bitch. Want to fucking dance with me? You know, so it's not that uh, uh, it's not that physical confrontation where the threat is issued first and then the decision is made to enter into mutual confrontation. We're not talking about that. We're talking about self defense. I got a bag of groceries in my hand. I, I've uh, just popped the boot of my car and I'm putting it in to you know to to make room in the back seat for my passenger. And boom, I get pounced upon. There's no decision to be made. I need to be able to defend myself now. You know. And so, so this mentality would then subsequently warrant uh, that you need to learn how to fight everywhere. And everybody can learn how to throw a punch and a kick or escape from a guard or a mount or something like that. When, when the weather is nice, you know, it's no problem to do that. But I, I'm often reminded of Mike Tyson's quote, you know, everybody got a plan until they get hit in the head with a left hook. <laughs> and, uh, and so the idea that by virtue of what can go wrong, <clears throat> we need to use those as guidelines with which to create what can go right when something goes wrong. I use the term in my dojo called Sensei Murphy. I say, you know, there's only one way to handle something that you don't understand, and that is by exploring and evaluating what its dynamics are. And so the guy says, what do you mean? I don't understand. Well, I said, okay, uh, like you, you come from, say, Taekwondo, which is, you know, you know, a kind of a competitive sports style and I mean, I'm sorry, I don't, you know, it looks a little bit more like Irish dancing these days, but um, that last, uh, you know, I think the last time I watched it was the Olympics where the, the guy, in, the Cuban guy kept getting cheated so badly that he turned around, spun kicked the referee in the head. <laughs> in pro- that was the best kick I'd seen in the whole uh, Olympics. You know? <laughs> anyway, well, I said to the guy, I said, look, you know, in Taekwondo, uh, you know, as a rule, you know, you have a particular set of practices, you have rules and regulations that dictate how you train and, you know, you can't punch or, or you can, but you don't get any points for it. You got to kick to the body, kick to the head like that. So that kind of dictates the training methodology that you would use you know, to establish the guidelines with which to, you know, win the contest, so to speak. I said, but from a self-defense point of view, you know, uh, how about, you know, how about if you're in a crowded space or a telephone booth or a car or something like that, and somebody pounced on you, you know, you're jumping, spinning, you know, it's not going to be effective. So how, I'm asking you then, how and what method do you have, which is traditionally uh, imparted in your school to negotiate, you know, having your garment pulled over your head while somebody else is trying to kick you in the face, you know, or, or you know, or somebody just, just, just dives in and tackles you from behind. And, you know, would you explain to me next? Well, we don't do that. And I said, well, if you don't do that and you are learning or imparting the information for the purpose of self-defense, you might want to, you know, maybe explore the value of that. You know, you might want to come outside your comfort zone and look for it. And of course, you know, tradition, sadly, uh, it shackles them to learning a certain set of skills and, and they can't or they won't go outside of that. And my theory was, look, at, um, I'm, I'm a great student of history. Um, I, I, and I'm also, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, a metaphor called Onko Chishin about studying the past to better understand, you know, the present with regards to the future. There's another kind of a twin uh, Koto Waza that goes along with that, and it's called Bunbu Ryodo, Bunbu Ryodo. And Bunbu Ryodo means, ah, in English, it's kind of like saying the pen and the sword, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, the pen and the sword in constant accord. A long, long, long time ago, you know, many, many generations ago, the people who pioneered this kind of this, uh, you know, Eastern Asian mentality with regards to warriorship and, and, and fighting and so on, kind of believed this, that, you know, warriors who are, you know, I mean, come on, I mean, you know, your job is to kill people. That's your job is, to, you know, it might be under the banner of, you know, protecting the, the kingdom or whatever, but you're, you're you know, you're a trained killer, basically, you know, and, uh, but with no wars to fight, you know, and no body of, uh, say, moral philosophy to protect or serve to uh, remind you of how to deal with a normal people, a behavior, normal, normal daily life. You, you're, you're a kind of dangerous person, you know, 
And people who spend so much time in the constant mindset of brutality, they don't think or you know, act the same as let's let's call them normal people in society, people people who are not warriors. And so this idea of blending uh the inward journey to explore and value the, your inner self and to come into contact with other practices which help balance the physicality of uh the brutal practices that you were embracing became part and parcel of becoming a warrior. You know, and, and some of that was maybe it was painting or poetry or, um, uh, or um, you know, a, any type of scholastic uh, pursuit, you know, history, uh, philosophy, spiritual, um, um, pedagogical, a, an area that would help balance your mind with your body. And uh, so this bumbu yodo mentality kind of, which is, which has become very, very part and parcel of the Eastern uh, pursuit of, of warrior practices. And I'm not referring to a particular style. I always think styles are, are usually have become individuals who have been successful either on the battlefield or in, 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 in fighting in some particular way. Um, uh, then formulated a pathway with which to embrace what they believed were functional practices. And, and here was a body of, of learning uh, that you could embrace, you know, let's say from the womb to the tomb, you know, you had a, you know, from the, from youth, you were mentored. And, and then, you know, at some point on that journey, you decided that you didn't need to be mentored anymore. And then, you know, you, and then, you know, you, you either went away on a journey or you, 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 gave back into the community that which had empowered you. And, th and this became known uh, subsequently as the warrior's journey, you know, and, you know, you are, you, you know, like you're, you're just a person. And one day, you know, you, they call it the awakening, right? In the sociology, you, know, you wake up and realize, or maybe you don't wake up, you know, but you're suffering from this, the symptoms of insecurity or, you know, all the things that drive us to better, uh, you know, learn of the identity struggle, who we are, where we're going, how we're going to get there, type of thing. Or you have a mentor who shows you how to do that. Or one of the one of the two. But there's this moment in time where you decide that's who I want to be. You know, and then and as and when, as long as there has been that question in life, there's always the need for a mechanism that that you know will show you how to get there, so, so to speak. You know, and so this 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 journey is about. Discovery first, wake up and discovery, and then and then finding the pathway. You know, I'm seeking the master. I'm traveling over mountains and across rivers, and until I come into contact with the master who can guide me. And you know, whether he's a little guy up on a mountain, or whether he's you know the, whoever you know, and it, <clears throat> and then there's that there's that struggle uh, about overcoming all the adversity because that's what the path was about. You know, the path was about adversity because adversity I itself becomes the, the teacher, you know, and I, and I used to, in my, in my, you know, in those, in my domain, let's call it my domain and those who, who, who fall under my influence, I, I try to bestow this message perhaps in different ways for different groups. You know, the, the way I might teach a child is not the same way I might teach a, a female or an alpha athlete or a challenged learner or an old person, you know, you know, I mean, the goals and the outcomes never change, but the process and the process never changes, but the way with which to impart that to different uh, audiences has to change, you know, and then of course, you know, learning how to overcome a barrier, whether you go through it, around it, over it, uh, or wait until the barrier goes away, you know, there's the, that requires uh, learning, you know. And then, of course, by the time you, you you know you you can clearly see that there's the empowerment waiting to behold, and you become empowered by that. Then the 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 the, the finality, of course, of this uh, this pathway, this journey, is not really a destination at all. It, it you realize it. This is it is just the journey, and so then your 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 goal becomes uh, one of them imparting this message this timeless message of love and respect and and and, and you know fitness and and and, and um, to those who, who have lesser knowledge who are also seeking seeking the way and and that that becomes the pathway and and that and so my study of history 
uh, you know, along this, you know, fascinating, you know, life that I've enjoyed. Uh, well, it's not always been so fascinating. And there's been a lot of adversity um, has taught me those types of things. And, and what I try to do and when I impart the lessons, and it doesn't matter if it's a competitive athlete or it's a challenged learner, you know, somebody with a mental or a physical um, limitation of some type, you know, there's there's always the warrior inside each of us and how we choose to uh, not necessarily uh, attain the goal. Uh, you know, it's, it's the pursuit, not the possession, right? You know, the, the race, not the finish. Right? Um, that requires the learning of this, you know, because, because the learning is what empowers you because, you, you know, show me a child uh, uh, with a passion for anything and I'll show you a, um, a, uh, a, a, a stairway to success. You know, what's the expression? The opposite to the contrary is uh, a, 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 an idle mind is a double to workshop, you know. And I think particularly with regards to the youth of today, uh, you know, there's that there's a burning need to keep kids fit. And uh, there's a burning need for them to find their own way and, and how to become passionate about something. Doesn't matter if it's tiddlywinks or God's sake, you know, but something to occupy their mind and to set goals so that they can uh, there's that's that's the goal. That's the outcome. And once you realize there's an outcome, the only other thing you need then is to learn uh, what the game plan is. Uh, how, what's the strategy from getting from here uh, to success? Uh, or even if it's just a mindset, how do I create that? Uh, uh, where Where's the lesson planning? Uh, how am I going to assess the criteria for uh, for accomplishing whether you know whether it's a, a three round, three five minute round MMA bout or five round or or it's or it's a marathon or it's or it's a uh, yeah you know it's a it's a it's a hundred kilometer walking race you know I mean or it's just dealing with my family or a loved one or overcoming a death in the family or you know uh, buying a piece of real estate or whatever whatever the challenge happens to be. You know, there's always the need for the mechanism to empower you to be able to accomplish that. And I think as long as there's that struggle for identity, there's always going to be a need for a mechanism. And that takes me back to the very beginning of the question. You said, how are you? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> this fighting art is is a, just simply a brilliant pathway. And there's another, there's a great Chinese metaphor that says, you know, something like um uh, you know, uh, in in Chinese culture, the, a mountain is always considered the arduous. It's a very, it's an art. You know, to climb to the top of a mountain is a, you know, is a challenge and it's an arduous pathway. You know, so they say there's many pathways that lead up the mountain, but there's only one moon to be seen by those who uh, reach its summit. And and uh, so so lots of pathways in life. And if you if we're just you say going back to the fighting arts, there's lots of pathways. You know. Aikido, Kendo, Judo, Penjak, Salat, Pujimi, Kung Tao, Pukalan, you know, Arnis, Dimana, Kali, Jikindo, MMA, USA, LSD. Oh, sorry, I go crazy there. Uh, you know, there's lots of there's lots of things that you can do, you know. And I think, but it always it helps if there's a clear goal in mind. Or it, even if there's not a say a, like an end goal that you're aiming for that there should be at least there should be some superficial goals so, oh i'm gonna get in i'm gonna get fit i'm gonna lose 10 pounds or gain i'm gonna gain 10 kilograms you know of muscle or, or i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm, I'm getting ready to race a five kilometer race or a 10 kilometer or a marathon you know and when there's some type of uh, physical goal or an emotional or spiritual goal you know you, you kind of get set on your way and the other the other part that i find quite interesting is is today when i when i speak to folks um well i've been speaking too many of this last year with the pandemic but uh, sure. um you know i i invariably see folks that are really focused on you know the cosmetic appearance of what they do and not so much on the functionality of what they embrace and um so so let me just end this little intro part Intro part uh, with with uh, something that I came up with from all my studies that made sense to me. And it, it, it it spoke very very loudly to me even when I was sleeping. And the funny part about it was some a guy asked me, "How did you come up with this, Manny? This is a great uh, this is a great. How did you come up with it?" And I said, "Ah, oh, just something I dreamt up." <laughs> And and you know I make I make light of it and joke, but it really was something I was 
really dreaming about it, you know. And of course, I was doing a lot of practice and a lot of research and a lot of studies. So my mind was consumed with this thing at the time. So it's not surprising that I was dreaming about it as well. But I thought, you know, going back to, say, for example, uh, empty handed, one against one confrontation. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's unpredictable. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, nothing's, uh, okay, I'm going to attack you with a punch first, then I'm going to try to knee you, I'm grabbing your neck, and then I'm going to throw you down, you know, it's not that, it's, 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 uh, ra- it's random, you know, it's unscripted, it's, and, and how do you deal with that? And I said, well, I thought to myself, you know, you know, there's a great expression that goes something like, you know, it's the sum total of its individual parts, you know, it's not, it's not, don't think of its individual parts, but think of that, the sum total of its individual parts, and I told I told you about the you know my pride guy my you know my UWF uh, shoot fighters and mission wrestlers up in the ring moving around early in the evening at the end of their day rehearsing how to you know how to receive certain types of impact and and if they were clinched so how to how to effectively negotiate you know that that under the arm front bear hug or whether or or, or somebody's grabbed in a headlock or a rear naked choke or something and and i thought you know if the if the if that rehearsal is a solo reenactment of how one effectively negotiates an act of physical violence which is quantifiable then in principle <clears throat> excuse me shouldn't all the other acts of physical violence which are habitual in human nature irrespective of culture time it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if it was 500 years ago in the Shaolin temple or 2000 years ago on the battlefield or yesterday in uh, Rattling of Vermont. Um, if someone puts you in a choke, I mean, there's only certain ways to choke people. Uh, you know, it's either with your bare hands, with one hand, with a garment, or I got you on the ground and I'm using the ground as a as a as a support beacon while I strangle with one hand. Now, there's only so many ways to do it, and I can either I can either deprive air through your larynx going to your uh, going to your lungs, or I can deprive the blood. Throw, flowing through the carotid artery to your brain. It's, it's, it's one or the other, or it's a combination of both. So by understanding in principle, and I'll, I'll just use this one point, uh, and you can make the deduction from the abstract based upon this, okay? Like, so so for, you know, joint manipulation, limb entanglement, escapes and counters, ground fighting, you know, percussive, you know, so I'll just say chokes and stranglers right now. So by understanding one of these, say, acts of physical violence, let's call it, let, let, let's just say a two-handed manual strangulation, okay? Yeah, uh, 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 which is very common, you know, if you study the forensics, as I do, about these acts of physical violence, you, you'll know that it's it's a silly, it's a silly thing. And, and you know, in self-defense, it's one of the easiest acts of physical violence to defend yourself against, but you would be amazed at how many victims, uh, how many fatalities there are every year around the world by two-handed manual strangulation. Uh, that that said, um, you know, you knock to the ground, you're, 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 you're dazed, some, some beasts, some gargantuas jumped on top of you, and he's strangling you to death, you know? And you can be a woman, a girl, a, 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 a man, an old person, or big, big, strong guy, but just dazed and, and this, and this, Fit. And and often I notice in the schools the the behavior that's associated with the brutality that we see in the real stuff is never it's never enacted in the dojos. You know, it's like you know, you know, I don't see any spitting, but any fuck you, you, you know. Sorry with the language, but you know, I don't see that uh, embraced in the pedagogical sense in the school. Now, when a guy attacks you with the reverse punch, you do this ridiculous thing. And I'm thinking, how crazy is that? So you you understand first by learning why that act of physical violence is dangerous. You understand this, I, and I'm not saying that everybody has to do this, but if you're if you're challenged or tasked with being an instructor, a person responsible for imparting 
the act, the, the self defense, then by virtue of its outcome, you, you, you there, sh- there should be some ethics there that say you have you better know what you're talking about, you know. So, and now let's say I, let's say, we'll just jump ahead quickly. I know everything there is to know about a two handed manual strangulation. I understand why the, you know, the, the contraction of the fingers and the flexing of the muscle and, and I, I'm my inability to be mobile because I'm being pound, I'm sat on, on the ground, I can't move. But, but oh, but look, my hands are free. So let's explore now the possibilities of defending yourself against that. And so, you know, let's say that the instructor, the teacher, the mentor, whoever says, okay, well, we're going to try this, 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 and this. And let's say it's a four-step plan or a five or two or whatever, you know. And, you know, you, you're, first of all, you're going to try to buck the guy, and maybe you're going to grab his hand or you're slide one in through. You're going to try to gouge his eyes, grab his hair, bite his, you know, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the tactical plan is, you know, you go through it. And, and you're doing this with passive resistance because right at that stage of learning, that's exactly, you're just learning what it's all about. You're becoming familiar with the act of violence. You're becoming gradually to exponentially uh, more confident with the way you're applying the skill all the time waiting to meet Sensei Murphy. (laughs) My students are Who's Sensei Murphy? <laughs> oh, he, well, he's the guy who teaches you what can go wrong, will go wrong when you don't want it to go wrong. That's Sensei Murphy. And of course, Sensei Murphy is there to give you the real lesson because learning the, learning the strangle is not so difficult. And even learning the escape, it's not so difficult. What's difficult is when it doesn't work. <laughs> That's the, that becomes the lesson. And, and it's one thing to be, you know, so, so let's say, uh, let's say I got a 50 kilogram guy on the ground and I'm, and I'm a hundred kilograms and I'm on top of him. And now, now I say, now let me see you scared bitch, you know. And, but now it's the other way around. I, I got a hundred kilogram guy on the top, but I'm filled with 50 kilograms. Well, that changes the dynamics, you know. And so, so, so the variables in the application practices on this pathway have to be size and gender. And, you know, when I say gender, for those, for anybody out there who's going to say, oh, he's sexist. Oh, he's, he's big biased. I'm not. I'm just telling you the facts. I'm telling you facts that if a 50 kilogram woman is on the ground being strangled to death, the chances of her handling that in the same way they say a 80 kilogram woman or a, or a, not, a or a 50 kilogram boy, man, is it, so weight, size, and gender often has a lot to do with that, you know. And so how you effectively negotiate that is by continuing to change your partners and gradually to exponentially uh, adding more aggressive resistance to the act of physical violence itself. So that the ultimate objective of that one particular act and all the little variables that may go on in it is that it's not new to you anymore. You've done it so many times with so many different people and under so many different uh, sets of circumstances that it no longer is new to you. You know exactly the pathway with which to follow under all these variables. Now, my point is this, is if you take that in principle, what I just said, to every quantifiable act, and you know, this is usually to my detractors, and I I haven't heard from many of them recently, but for the one or two maybe who may be still out there, they, oh, McCarthy thinks he knows everything, you know, and I said, well, I don't think I know everything. But let me put it this way. If you went to, say, uh, say you finished high school and you said, you know, uh, you know, you had a brother and the brother said, you know something, I don't think much of tertiary education. I'm going to go become a plumber and I'll work for the rest of my life. You know, good, good for you, great. The other guy says, no, you know, I want to pursue uh, university education because I want to become a teacher or, or whatever, you know, or I want to become a doctor or a lawyer, or one of, you know, one of the classic traditions. So so that person can go to a uh, tertiary level background, some, some, some college or university you know, on their open house day, and they can say things, hey, excuse me, uh, I was thinking about taking engineering, uh, maybe civil or electrical, whatever, you know, I just like, you know, like, what am I going to be able to do when I, when I get my, you know, my certificate, and you know, what do I have to do to be a master of this? And I go, oh, well, you know, first you have to, you know, you have to, uh, you know, get your bachelor of, uh, of uh, edu- uh, your, your bachelor degree first, and then you have to go into a master's to say a two year, and it's, it's X amount of subjects, and you know every semester you have the subject load, and and yeah, okay, well I don't know, let's say uh, design engineering one hundred three, you know semester two week five, uh, what am I going to be studying from? Oh, hang on just for a sec. 
Let me open up the module descriptor. Let me run down. That's week five, did you say? Okay, lesson seven. Oh, there you go there. Oh, uh, you're going to be studying, and he cites the uh, book, and he cites the lesson, and he says, this is the assessment criteria, and that's the outcome. And you go, thank you very much. You know, I, I just, I never see that, you know, in the fighting arts. I always wonder, I'm not trying to be, you know, overly academic, but I'm thinking, you know, if you want to quantify how to master something, shouldn't you know about it first? And if that's the case, and, and if a guy's talking about, you know, you know, those kids that walk through the, the you know, I would say <laughs> youth <laughs> wasted on the young, you know, you know, the kids that walk by the, the dojo on their way down to do, you know, their, their, their contact training looked at uh, a class at where I was teaching the first move out of Basai Dai. And it's a, it's a very simple uh, exercise. You know, you're being clinched, you're being shoved up against a wall and you're, you know, you're being strangled with one hand as the guy's pumping you in the face with his right fist. And there's this tactic where, you know, you, where, you know, you kind of uh, protect the, the left side of your face because most people are right handed. Most people are punching you. It lights up with the right fist. And, and, you know, you, you, you want to kind of, you know, spit in his face, finger, flick his testicles, do whatever you can to, to latch on, let's let's call it an overhook, if you will, to with your left arm to his right hand, and you know, shove your fingers in his eyes, and you know he's got one hand free, it's left, and you're shoving your fingers straight into his eyes. You know, there's there's two options. There's there's one to pull the hand away, or the other one is to push the hand away, because that's called from a chemical and a physiological point of view, it's called a, a pain withdrawal reflex action. And right away, you push the arm off to the side, and he says, that I elbow him in the face, I loop arm, and I put a guillotine on him. I then let the so-called uh, 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 the overhook arm go. I grab my own right fist, and then so that so that the so that the attacker is not able to solidify his balance. I wrap in, you know, when I was a kid in high school, wrestling, we used to call it a grapevine. Um, it's an Ippon Ashidachi, by the way, in karate. <laughs> when I wrap my right leg behind his knee in the popsicle foss and then put my instep behind my own leg, I basically render this person immobile so he can't, he can't, you know, use his uh, mobility to push away. And because the, the 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 guillotine is causing pain, he's starting to see scars. Stars. He doesn't know what to do first, and bang, he falls asleep. And um, that's that first opening move of Basai Dai, for example. And and uh, at the end of the class, I went down and I said to the guys, I said, "Hey, hey guys, I said, uh, you know, I said if we did this with shorts and a rash guard, you would say, oh, that was great. You dropped the leg and you put a guillotine on.'" But I did it with a with a gi on, and I did it in a structured way. <laughs> this other kid in class goes, he he was a newbie, you know. And he said, he goes, yeah, you know, I was I did Jeet Kune Do before we came here, you know. And you know, we, we don't do that crap, and you know, on Jeet Kune Do, it's real freestyle. And I said, oh, really? Oh, no. I said, can you show me a? Can you show? And I'm a, and I'm a huge fan of Jiggity, by the way. You know, as I am with Salat, and, and, and don't get me started. You know, and Innocento, and I, I know, I know so many of Bruce's students who I've met and trained with, and you know, developed friendship with over the year. You know, but over the years, when I said, can you explain me what you mean. Well, you know, you, I put my hands like that, my back heels up on the, I stick a left jab, and I got a nice uppercut, and I get a hook punch, and if I miss with, miss with the hook, I got the elbow, and I can grab him in a guillotine and do a back roll, I mount him, I pump him in the face a couple of times. And I go, that, that's, that's great. That is an absolute, I just have one question. Yeah, what is it? How'd you learn that? Like, I mean, like, did you get it through osmosis, or like, did someone actually show you that step by step? Uh, we, well, of course I showed me stuff, but how else do you think I would have got it? Well, I don't know. I mean, the way you're talking, this is like, you know, it was like uh, it, it, it arrived uh, from Mount Sinai on a tablet into your brain and you, you just woke up one morning and you had it. I said, you got that because somebody showed you. And when somebody says you do this first, you do this second, that's third, let's, let's just jump the science for a minute. I always love the science. You know, because it, what we're talking about is really science and art mixed together in a training facility called it a dojo, or a gym, a snake pit, whatever you want, to create the magic that I'm talking about. And the the, the coach, the guru, the, the whoever, they used a template. They said, left hand, right hand, left of apricot, do this, or shoot in for the double leg, and when he does this, you know. So you had a, you had a formula. A formula is a template. A kata is merely a template. 
It's a lot of solo representations against acts of physical violence that are habitual and quantifiable in human nature that all have classical responses to them. In the same way that a BJ, you know, and it's funny, you know, the BJJ guys have no problem understanding this at all, you know. The Kets wrestlers, they have no problem understanding it. In fact, in fact I, I think that they're part of the people who kept us alive for all these years, you know. But what's, what's happened is you get into a culture, Eastern culture, and there's a lot of historical um, madness that have gone on, say, from around 1840s, starting with the box, uh, the Opium War, leading up to the Boxer Rebellion, leading to Japan's entry to Manchuria, to leading to the occupation of, of the East with the Japanese. And, you know, a lot of people, when I was talking about, you know, the Eastern fighting arts are kind of a, a microcosm of the culture from which they come, they don't fully grasp what they what I mean by that. because. Anybody who's passionate about looking at the history of uh, technical and tactical uh, ambiguity uh, of our tradition, they tend to stumble over contemporary assumption without understanding the landscape and the mindset of the people who pioneered this tradition. You know, you know, it's the old joke about, uh, uh, you know, tradition is not about uh, blindly following a guy who's holding the ashes in a box, but it's continuing to seek out. Uh, what those pioneers were themselves seeking. You know, there's every generation produces, uh, you know, people, let's call them innovative uh, people who, in an effort to keep their, uh, their, their teachings a living uh, uh, contribution to the communities that they serve, find reason with which to reinterpret the common principles upon which it rests. And in doing so, and in spite of the lip service paid to minds better than yours, is they're just developing um, more innovative ways of doing the very same thing. And so getting to the point about this, uh, this mindset, I'll explain very clearly how the classical mess evolved. It was simply like this. Um, modern Japanese culture is based upon a millennium of, uh, of male-dominated, uh, homogeneous, um, um, uh, extremely discriminatory culture of conformity, uh, nestled nicely up into a hermetically sealed Confucian-based mindset, whose first tenet is filial piety, which is a fancy term for uh, ancestor worship. And and the the principal belief in ancestor worship is that uh, is that you there's no questioning of authority. Now, can you imagine that? So so you can't question anybody who's an authority. Uh, and the, the authority is responsible for imparting um, a timeless lesson. But the timeless lesson has become so overly ritualized and never critically thought of or ne never questioned. Um, uh, and you think, well, what, what kind of mechanism could pop? Because, you know, we in the West, <laughs> that's not who we are. <laughs> I mean, if the government and the tax department would like us to be like that, but we're, we're not like that. And our best friends... Six of them begin with the letter W and one begins with the letter H. That's our friends. We're individuality is the arts that measures our character. We need to know everything about everything now. <laughs> we don't want to wait till we're 90 to get all oh, the answer is inevitable. So the mechanism here in the East and in Japanese, although it exists in Chinese as well, but in, in Japanese, we call it the Senpai Kohai system. And that's, and that's a system of mentorship, imitative behavior. Uh, the, the junior is always has to do what the senior says and never, ever question it. And so, so imitative behavior, uh, and the trickle down effect perpetuates a narrow mind. Sorry. Did I say that out loud? Let me edit that out. Okay. A mindset that doesn't a permit questioning of authority. And then there's still got to be something else to it. I'm glad you asked. Here it is, is the another little time. And I love metaphors because those are the wisdom of a lifetime of a person who thought about a certain particular thing until they realized if there's no other way that's there's more succinct to understand it. A straight line is the, you know, the shortest distance, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and so you've got this whole mentality behind not questioning authority, but I'm, I'm going to question authority. So the metaphor in Japanese goes like this. Deru kui wa utareru. Or there's another version that goes. Deru kugi wa utareru. So kui means peg. And kugi means nail. And the metaphor goes something like this. A protruding nail ultimately gets pounded down. And you know what I mean. You got a, a nail that keeps popping up on a, a floorboard or something. 
If you see it up, you, you take a hammer and you pound it back down again. And if you've done that three or four times and the nail doesn't stay down, you, you pluck it out, right? So the metaphor is this in Japanese or Chinese culture. If you, you know, don't shut up and keep training and keep asking questions, you know, they're going to say, hey, shut up and train. Hey, shut up. And hey, hey, don't ask that question. The answer is intu- intuitively obvious. Just wait. You, you know, and you say, no, I want it now. They'll, they'll, if you keep getting out of line, then someone's going to ostracize you. You know, so you're, you know, you're put down, you're put down, you're put down, you're put down until you realize either don't ask questions anymore or you're kicked out. And that's a, you know, it's funny when I talk to folks, you know, guys, especially guys around my age, you know, getting closer to 70 years old now, you get, you, you get guys who've been training as long as I have from the 50s and 60s. They say, oh my God, yeah, I remember that. You could never ask a question in class. I had to do it a certain way. You know, it never really met the criteria for reality, but I was I was told to do it. So the senpai kohai system with all these little uh, caveats became the tradition itself. I bow going into the door. I follow this ritual. I do that protocol. I do this. And pretty soon, the tradition is so complicated by overly ritualized, I'm oh, sorry, for, for for rituals that had you know specific meanings i mean these are not without meaning or without purpose but you expected that at the end of the training you would become functional and the problem was that you weren't becoming functional you were only repeating something that really was never tested for its veracity so let me back up a little bit now and say bruce lee's rid yourself of the classical mess discard what is um not useful and use what is functional. So, so my journey has been one of that. And I, and, and, and while on this journey, I discovered it's not my journey. I mean, of course it's my journey, but I mean, I was coming into contact with these things. Wow. Why didn't I think of that before? How come somebody didn't teach it to me? And I kind of realized that it's because it's become overshadowed by the popularity of its cosmetic appearance and its appeal to the masses, which reminds me of a quote that goes something like, you know, just because everybody's doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's right. And so you find yourself in a position where, the, you know, you're doing it a certain way and you realize it must have always been done this way by people who knew what they were doing. Because if they didn't know what they were doing, they wouldn't have lasted or, or made a name or, or be able to establish uh, a methodology. And so when I go back to that, I say, the the passionate love affair I had with embracing Kanta as a solo uh, example of of um, um, I want to say of, of of embracing and exploring who you are and, and what you can do um, became a, a wonderful form of expression. The fact that it was filled with uh, applications against very brutal practices in many ways remains a secret to a lot of people. And what I mean to say is the guy, the kid who's, oh, by the way, and um, it's funny because the kid, and at least kids have been with, I've, I've still been with me for 30, 40 years, you know. This kid's come back to me a few years later. He goes, oh, Sensei McCarthy, you know, do you remember me? And I went, yeah, 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 from the Brisbane Dojo, uh, MMA guys. Oh, I don't do MMA anymore. I said, oh, why not? It's a, it's a wonderful practice. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. He said, I love it. He had nothing bad to say about it. He said, uh, but I just found uh, that there was something a little bit more holistic. It was less, it was less demanding on my body. Um, and, I, and I found this other practice. And I went, oh, congratulations. And, and I said, he, said, he goes, I, what I wanted to say was, I was watching a UFC fight. It was Johnny Bones Jones and Machida. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I remember that, 257. No, 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 it was, a, it was earlier. And, and he had him up against the cage. And and uh, and, um, and Bones put his hand on his face. And Machida knocked the arm out of the way. And, and you know, Jones got those long arms. He elbowed him in the face. And he wrapped, his, he wrapped a guillotine around him. And, and, he, put, and he, put the, he put the leg lock on him. And, or sorry, the... the, 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 the um, uh, the grapevine around the leg and uh johnny mccarthy couldn't get in fast enough to to untangle them because uh uh machina went to sleep and i went okay and your point is he goes well don't you remember i came into the dojo one day and i saw you guys doing exactly that move and i said i said oh you know uh, and you you told me what a traditional move and i said yeah and he says i saw the mma guys doing it too and i went ah. i said there you go i said 
you know, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. And um, a lot of these practices are really timeless. They don't belong to style or school. They belong to methodology and survival. And um, so I guess in, in many ways, the mindset of the group of uh, folks that I generally uh, have the pleasure or opportunity uh, to work with are people who think like that, you know, and um, they uh, it, it's it's and it's a great feeling of, of um, empowerment and gratitude. I feel when I watch someone who I've been able to plant seeds with and uh, and and let them embark upon a journey. That, that 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 does the four things that it 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 um, it conditions their body and for all of their life you know you just can't have a body that's conditioned uh, for you know for the time you fight what about when you grow old you you, know, you you need to stay healthy all your life you know if nothing else just to fight disease you know and 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 you know physical fitness is the seat of mental well-being you know uh, and that is to also to condition your mind and um and uh, and certainly you know one of the problems, especially as we as we enter our latter years in life, is you know people retire from their jobs and they you know they become involved with their hobbies and they gradually grow older and they stop thinking about doing things and you know because the brain is not active they grow old and die and so so keeping the mind active is a wholly important part of the fighting arts as well you know and that's also the need for the i mentioned earlier the boom boo you know the 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 it's not just the physical part that has to be embraced and of course regulate it and continually change to meet you know to meet these changing uh, changes in your life because change is the really the only thing that is truly inevitable in life but it's also the intellectual and scholastic uh, uh, part of the practice as well where you have you're engaged in something, whether it's learning to speak another language, say Japanese or Chinese or, or another language, or, or you're learning how to cook or paint or sculpt or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. You, you, you just keep busy. And, and then, of course, this, the spiritual thing. And that's a difficult thing for young people, you know, in the spiritual thing, you know. But, but certainly, <laughs> I can tell you that certainly the older people get the more valuable, you know, looking towards something that's that's uh, more powerful than your your simple little self that becomes a wholly important thing something else to believe in something that 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 you realize you know soon the inevitable end will be here and you want to look back across your life and 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 you don't want to look back across with regret what is what is this don't regret the past uh, fear of the future or miss the moment. It's all about right now. You know, what lies behind you or before you is nothing compared to what lies within you. And so to look at that, that flash of life that you had and look back and say, you know, that was a life well lived. And I think that that's, that's why I keep looking, um, uh, into this, the traditional part about what we do, not so much for, you know, that, that you know, I had I had the run as a champion as a kid, you know, and I went. I should have probably stayed on to it far too long, but uh, I still have the <laughs> I still have the aches and pains and and bone bruises and and scar tissue to to uh, remind myself of that, you know, that youthful preoccupation with fighting. Um, but but there's still the the passion is still there. It just it's just bundled up in a different way. I spend a lot of my time. Um, uh, coming into contact with folks who who haven't yet maybe discovered this particular end of it and uh, another wonderful part is to bump into people who have already either done this or or far surpassed me at it and so i either become the student again or i become the colleague of or i just become the opportunity of becoming a partner with somebody to to train so i had the learning part i continue to learn I had the practice part, and you still have the practice part, and and then you have the training part. And the training part is, in my opinion, is really the beautiful part. It's where the science and the art has come together to create the magic, and that magic is yours. And I'll just close this part on saying this: there was a there was a uh, there was a traditional uh, karate master named. Uh, uh, 
Toyama Kanken. And a lot of people don't know who he is. He, you know, he never reached the uh, the heights of popularity that, you know, say Gogen Yamaguchi the Cat or Masoyama God Hand or, you know, Gichin Funagoshi that those guys did. But he was nonetheless, in my opinion, a brilliant innovator and a pioneer. But he summed it up really, really nicely. He said, you know, when I die, my style dies. You know, because the stuff, that's me. You know, my, my style's me. You know, it's, that's what I do. That's, uh, that's the pathway I forged. It's, it's what, it's how I effectively negotiate all of these tributaries in life, you know. And I hope, if nothing else, that my, that my lesson serves to inspire you to look beyond that template and find the way, you know, using the building block, using the alphabet. I mean, the alphabet's never going to change. The acts of physical violence, they don't change. You know, an arm, but there's, it's either, you know, there's, there's these five ancient machines, you know, there's three categories of lever, you know, there's the screw, the wedge, the pulley, and the fixed axle and wheel. And I'm telling you that it doesn't matter what style or tradition you come from, if it's empty handed one against one, it falls into two categories, percussive impact or seizing. And all the stuff in the journal, like personal takedown, strangulation, throw, grab and grab, escapes, per all of these things have to do with flexion, extension, pronate, supinate, you know. And, and so when you strangle somebody, you're, you know, you're flex, that's flexion, you know. And you're arm barring somebody, that's, well, if it's a category one lever, you know, you're, you're hyper uh, extending uh, a joint. And, and when you understand how the human body works, uh, and you understand that uh, force is mass times acceleration, uh, that uh, if I, hey, I hit the guy, it didn't hurt. Well, you probably didn't excel uh, enough into the target zone with the right tool to be able to create. You know, if I got to hit a guy with the right hand, I can't throw it at him with Tai Chi speed. I need to be able to create the understanding of, of uh, acceleration. So, so I need to study more about mobility. Hence, should I call my my style Newton rule or something? You know, or or should I, if I'm a grappler, should I say? I do Archimedes rule, you know, uh, but I am saying this, that if, you know, if you're charged with being an instructor in life uh, and, and functionality is, is at the top of your uh, mandate, then you need to learn these common mechanics and these applied, this applied science, because what we're doing is a little more than just science. And the, and the art part about it is what makes it individual. If I have 50 students in class and I say, okay, hey, welcome to Pat's art class today. You know, that's... Uh, these are the color inks or pastels or watercolor or oil or whatever it is. That's the canvas. These are the little brushes for uh, eyelashes. There's the big brushes for mountains. Uh, here's a snot rag that you can, you can pull out of your back pocket and you can rub the clouds to give them some texture. Uh, now paint me, uh, paint me a tree. You know, 50 different people, I guarantee you're going to get 50 different trees or 50 different flowers or, you know. And, and that's the beauty about the art is if, because of the art's all the same. Where's the beauty there? Where's the individuality there? Not everybody can do the same thing the same way to achieve the same outcome. And I'm we're very well known for saying this, that a deeper understanding of the same thing is even you will not be able to do the same thing the same way to achieve the same outcome across the spectrum of your life simply because of the of the ravages, ravages of age and, and what it does to your body. But... The acts of physical violence by which your means would become a tradition, they're never going to change. And that, you know, that youthful, uh, brutal behavioral uh, activity that approaches you on two legs saying, hey, bitch, you got a fucking problem. Sorry. So I apologize for the, the language. Okay. But, you know, okay. once again, it's part and parcel of a uh, behavioral science uh, and pedagogical look at the brutality that surrounds what it is that brings us together. And I tell you, I don't care what style you're from, what brings us together is far more important than anything that separates us. But it's the veneer of uh, politics that, you know, protectionism and insecurity that creates this inability to look at something and see it for what it truly is. And then, of course, don't forget, <laughs> you know, there's money as well, right? And that's the business part about, you know, I always got to get a kick out of uh, Joe Rogan, you know, and uh, <laughs> when, when Joe was, you know, uh, uh, you know, help co-commentating the fights, you know, and, you know, in the early stages, you know, uh, you know, before the, let, let's call them before the, the naive public 
knew much about what was going on, you know, and, and you know, and, and the immigration owned, you know, they owned the franchise or they, they owned the UFC. And, and you know, there was, oh, my God, look at that BJJ, his BJJ, his jujitsu was awesome. That's sick shit, man. And, you know, as <laughs> as uh, as things uh, as things grew and, you know, as pride got more and, and rings and Pankrats and uh, K1 and as the world began to expand with the MMA concept, and we started seeing a lot more less gi, more no gi, uh, which is really was really based a lot on on the catch wrestling. And let's be let's be honest, okay? But, you know, if, if I went to a jujitsu school 25, 30, 30 years ago or forty years ago with, with a pair of uh, shorts and a rash guard on, they'd say, uh, "Like, what are you doing here? Like, go put your knee on." <laughs> you know? And I'm I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing, you know, because because. Uh, evolution is just about that. It's about change and coming into contact with, with, uh, with, uh, with more innovative ways of doing the very same thing. So now I don't have a gi on, and you know, I'm, 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 it's it's round two, and I'm I'm sweating, and I'm like, you know, I don't have a I don't have a handle to grab onto. It's uh, you know, but I remember Joe. Yeah, my God, is is jujitsu is uh, awesome? Never thought jujitsu is <laughs> wrestling. It was catch wrestling, and. And but but again that that doesn't that doesn't pay the line that, you know that's not towing the line right because because everything's part and parcel of a larger business and if I've if I've read into that wrong I I apologize to Mr Rogan because otherwise I'm I'm a, I'm one of the, I'm a huge fan of his work you know and 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 not just as a, the martial art of the podcasting but as a comedian and the guy's a, a real stand up guy but but calling it for what it is is important and I think that that that's that stuff that what brings us together is not is is way more important than what separates us and that's one thing about yeah. the business part the business is the politics and you know it's like if i have a if i have a sandwich shop uh on elm street and you open a sandwich shop across the street from me you know there's going to be a little bit of rivalry i don't care how nice hi good morning neighbor you know there's always going to be that hey i want you to buy your sandwiches in my shop not his shop so hence, hence the advertising. My sandwiches are the best, and my style is the best. And that goes on all the time. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just that is that you know that's the marketing part about it. But you know, my look as an as as an educator, or as a coach, a mentor, a sensei, if you will, is I'm not so interested in producing you know the, like the toughest guy in the world as I am with helping people to you know, just embrace uh, life in general, you know, and how to, how to, you know, when they get to a certain age, look back and say, that was a really wise decision. I really, really super enjoyed, you know, the training, the learning, the practice that people I came into contact with. And, and, and I use a, a, a little uh, byline for our group. It's, it's like-minded people uh, pursuing common goals. And I think that the science of what that means can represent everything, you know. And so it doesn't matter what, from what, you know what walk of life you're from what culture you came from you know um it, it's it's uh it, it the science is the same for for acceleration it's the same for uh, the five ancient machines and show me any technique and i'll just show how it applies to it as well and i think that the other thing about that as well is when when folks um grasp that um Let's call it the red pill, okay? Do you remember that? Do you remember the Matrix? Yeah, great movie. You took the, you took the red pill, took the green pill, you know, and uh, you know, and and so let's say if you if you have the eyes to see the Matrix of what we're doing, it's all the same. It's all the same. There's no difference at all. And where where differences start to appear is in uh, is cosmetically uh, rules and regulations, uh, costumes. You know, and uh, you know, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do this. You have to wear this. You have to do that. You have to, you know. And so that that then, every time we add a new player to the table or to the game, let's say, then it uh, it reduces. It may enhance in some areas, but it reduces the fact. Uh, once again, I'm just saying. Let, let's say you know, you're 50 kilograms. You get attacked by Gargantua. And uh, Gargantua is grabbing uh, uh, under the arm, under the arm, bear hugs, and it's going to try to break your back and then fling you down on the ground. You know, your hands are completely free, as are your face, and, and the guy's right in front of you. And you say, you know something? And, and you, you take your thumbs and gouge them into his eyes, uh, you know, trying to, trying to p- put your thumbs into the basal ganglia out to the back of his skull while you're headbutting his nose and then biting 
the rest of it off. I'm thinking, you know something, it's probably not the, I don't know how you'd practice that in a dojo. One, two, okay, spit in his face, headbutt his nose, and gouge his, you know, that's not, it's not like throwing, you know, a combination of punches at a bag or something. But it is nonetheless the reality of what's going to save that poor person's life and prevent them from being a statistic or a victim, you know. And so once again, I go back and say, I don't say this is better or worse. I'm just simply saying that as an art of self-defense, what uh, what was really compelling for me was to better understand how this ambiguous practice called kata function what why does it last it so long and in, been embraced as the the art when nobody knows what it means or worse even still there be there it's been embraced when the guy throws the, the punch throw punch throw punch no no no, no that's too fast no, no. <laughs> and then they go on <laughs> to explain this ridiculously uh you know this functional application practice thinking that it's going to work and and i and i just it's all and no place is that more evident now than all over youtube you know guys who are you know guru this and eighth don that and you know who should be doing a few more sit-ups first than, than rather than you know you know yeah well, that's, that's true you know and and uh you know they're they, they the japanese we say kuchibushi you know mouth warriors and and they you know they have an answer for everything and uh and yet and i don't I, i'm not saying you know i'm not saying that you have to be uh you know uh, um arnold schwarzenegger to to describe uh, you know, to learn how to bodybuild. I'm not saying that, you know, you, you don't have to be Italian to make pasta either, you know, and uh, or to make good pasta, you know. Oh, maybe my collaborator friend would argue with me, but, you know, you, I don't believe that you have to be, you know, you had to have 60 fights, you know, to, to teach someone how to fight. Look at Gus Diamato with Mike Tyson, for example, as just as one one example, you know. I don't, I don't think that, but but there has to be a way with which to test the veracity of what you're doing. And if you are learning it for self-defense, I believe wholly that the things that I've just outlaid in this, uh, in this uh, um, explanation, I hope that that has covered it. And I hope that, uh, I hope that the folks that are, are uh, you know, listen or are listening, or if they do listen, <laughs> or they go, who the hell is this guy? Let me hang on. You know, uh, if they listen to this, I hope, I hope there's a message. There. Oh, I hope it's one of commonality. I hope it's one where uh, perhaps people from any, any or any other style can listen to it and find, and, and find the halfway mark. Oh, you know, you know what he's talking about? We do that in la la la. Oh my God. Oh, this kid, this McCarthy's a traditional karate guy and he does that. Oh my God. You know, and, and because believe me, what I, <laughs> You know, I believe that I'm a traditional karate practitioner. The only problem is all the traditional karate people don't believe that that's the case. <laughs> they think what I'm doing is, oh, that's not karate. And they and they have hammered me for so long that what I do is not karate. I said, okay, it's not karate. Um, let me look back into history far enough back. Oh, good, look at, look at. The term karate itself became ratified as a Japanese martial art in December of 1933. There's, that's another time for another conversation. And then before that, in the, in the couple of decades leading up to that, it was embraced in Okinawa as an adjunct to uh, group exercise in the school system to serve the war machine during a period of radical military escalation. So its practice was no longer embraced for its function uh, but rather uh, as a mechanism to focus on physical fitness and social conformity. And that's where the the problem began. So when you, and, and of course, you know, so, so the karate today, uh, you know, which is, and some, geez, some of these guys are the remarkable athletes. They can just do things that just, you stand there in awe of watching the guy. He, he just kick him in the head. I didn't even see his leg move, you know. And, and you know, but, it, but so the coaching skills are much better today. But, but what I'm trying to say is, is if you look back and, and look at kata, you know, if punching and kicking was all there was to fighting, why the need for the kata in the first place, you know? And there's an expression that kata is karate and karate is kata. And if that's the case, then... You know, and and the people doing these overly ritualized techniques that have seemingly no meaning, or the meaning that's prescribed to them is pre preposterous or incongruous, uh, no connection to reality at all. Then, then, then let that uh, uh, be an opportunity to uh, for a door to open and a guy like me to come through and say, 
it actually does have meaning. And it's no different from your coach uh, showing you how to smash a guy in the face with, with a lead uppercut who's throwing a right hand at you, you know. And But this is how you have to practice it. Here are the lines and the angles of trajectory. Here's the practice module. Here's how you have to set it up and, you know, all that type of thing, right? And, and not everybody can do it, you know. And so, so finding the meaning requires a, a contextual premise. And so, so my lifetime of study brought me into contact with this. And I refer to it as the HAPV theory, the H-A-P-V theory, the acts, uh, uh, habitual acts of physical violence, and that there's this two-person reenactment practice which links together the act of violence with the prescribed uh, template. And and for the detractors who go, yeah, well, uh, you know, the you know the the, the 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 template might not work if the guy does this. And I go, wow, you have a wonderful way of describing the obvious, you know. And uh, well, that's that's why <laughs> once you learn the templates, you have to practice it with all kinds of different people under varying circumstances, so that you can be prepared for the unpredictable, have a random. And it's funny after a few years of practicing this stuff. Uh, and that's why I say the joke is, well, it's not really a joke, but that's why I say, you know, in, in, in our uh, school is, you know, the, the BJJ guys get it the best, you know, and, the, and you know, the wrestlers get it the best. The catch, we're catch wrestlers, by the way, we're not BJJ guys. But, and uh, that's my, my support there. But, you know, when you're on the ground rolling with somebody, you know, and, and, and you feel this, oh, that guy's trying to lock me down, you know, so I better put all my focus on getting out of that lockdown or my, I'm going to get my knee dislocated or something, you know. And so, so you know, you, 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 whether it's pain that motivates you or it's experience that allows you to move in the way that you do or tap <laughs> or tap <laughs> uh, and then just continue moving and rolling is, is that's part and parcel of the practice. So what I'm saying is that same thing is, possible in stand-up clinch uh and and ground as well and 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 that it once it was once uh an an, an avid practice here in okinawa it was called tegumi by the way and uh but you know but now now nowadays tegumi well first of all tegumi disappeared around the turn of the century and then by the time it did reappear under name it was called muto in one area and then it became called, known as okinawan sumo which is mm, arguably a little bit like Japanese sumo, where the art is not the, you know, you're not, a, you know, you're not uh, there to close fist impact people. But you know, you look at uh, say uh, Japanese sumo, these guys bitch slap each other pretty friggin' hard, you know, and and uh, and sometimes they can either get out of the way and let the guy fall down because he's going so hard at them, or they can butt heads. And but that's one thing. The old school of tegumi, which evolved into, um, let me say, a, a ritual or rite of passage for boys evolving into men, uh, became, after a while, especially in the pre- and post-war years in Okinawa, became kind of a, you saw it at festivals here where boys would, uh, you know, try to grab each other and throw each other down on the ground. And, and now they wear kind of a judo jacket and grab a belt and do that. It's almost like Mongolian wrestling, you know. But back in the day, they kind of cross hands. You remember the uh, uh, the opening fight scene on Enter the Dragon with uh, Bruce Lee and Samu Hung? You know, they had just yeah. had a pair of black shorts on, the Bruce Lee gloves. Very, very, very uh, MMA type thing, you know. And did you did you remember how they started the match? You know, the they they crossed hands. You know, it's like it's been a little while. You know, and it, yeah. It, it was, uh, there's a, it's like a, in, in swordsmanship, we do you want to cross swords, you know, and do you want to fight, you know, the crossing of swords was the, the beginning of the fight. And, and if the swords were not crossed, there was no need to fight. And if the hands are not crossed, there's no need to fight. So the point being, if you're, if you're standing back and there's space between you and the person who's got the hands up in front of you, then in a self-defense situation, the decision all, doesn't always have to be to engage the person, you know. It can be to run away and live to fight another day, if you will, you know. I ignoring the ego-related distractions, you know. And so when you cross hands, that's where this whole trapping and, you know, the, the, the Wing Chun, the Jeet Kune Do, the, the Kali, the, the, those practices which are bread and butter for trapping and checking and impacting in those arts um, were once also a valid part of the Okinawan practice. But it had been lost 
uh, you know, in the sands of time, largely because of this conformist-based culture and the art being embraced for something other than its original functionality. And so when I go out to teach, and I just, well, I'm, I, I don't know, that's how far your broadcasts uh, uh, goes, but I just want to give a heads up to Sensei Terry O'Neill from Fighting Arts International, probably the best uh, martial art magazine on the planet during its during its heyday. Uh, it's no longer there now, and but uh, he was the first person who um, opened the door for me to do seminars uh, professionally, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, that that opportunity back in 1993 to go and teach in England uh, was a, was a was scary moment for me. Let me tell you, you know, and not not realizing, you know, how these these this, the way I talk would be embraced, you know, because you know if you, if you meet people who know me, it's either they love me or they hate me. There's very few in between, you know, you know, because what I say and the way I describe tradition is very much a challenge to uh, what others believe about tradition, you know, and, you know, time and grade, rank, lineage, you know, all that type of stuff. And, uh, and, um, and I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't, uh, I never, ever intend uh, to uh, want to intimidate or embarrass or, or, discredit or disrespect any of those traditional teachers at the wall, far from it, to tell you the truth. Uh, I found nothing but uh, wonderful people who've welcomed me with open arms uh, here. Now, and I, I never question them about their friends, you know, whether they smoke or drink or how they how they act and, or if they're good fathers or husbands or wives or friends. Uh, that's none of my business, really. My only concern ever in, in, in the research mode, you know, cross comparative training and studies and so on was 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 it functional what was 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 what this organization that group this dojo that school of guru that person that instructed the coach was what they were imparting was it scientifically sound and did it, did it work you know there's a there was a fighter <laughs> fighter yeah i guess that'd be a good way to describe it. in england his name was lenny mclean they call him the governor the governor and uh, you know, as the story goes, uh, he could never get a never pass a medical to to get his uh, to license to fight in the ring. So he did a lot of he did a lot of ring fighting in you know like uh, in in alleyways and you know uh, what do you call it? underground fights everything you know. And uh, he Len and there's you know you can if you YouTube uh, some of the listeners can go to YouTube and and you know type type in Lenny McLean the governor you know and uh, I think there's I think there's I think there's still a couple of fights. Uh, and, you know, there's just one that I remember the most. And, and um, you know, they're in the ring and, you know, Lenny puts his cigar out first and gets his gloves on. And, you know, and he's sitting in the ring. The other guy just finishes his uh, glass of cognac, you know, and he spits it out on the side. And they come into the center of the ring and, you know, the referee's going, OK, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And, and you know, Lenny goes to, uh, you know, put his gloves up. I've got to tap him. <laughs> It's Ron Shaw. Ron Shaw headbutts him in the face. <laughs> Let the fight begin. <laughs> and then Lenny just let him, Lenny beat the living shit. I mean, I don't think Lenny ever lost to tell you the truth. My hero was Lenny McLean. So, so, so I just say that as a kind of a joke, you know, because, you know, McCar oh, McCarthy's science, you know. But I mean by the science and the way I speak, it's mostly just for the coaches and the, and the, and the, uh, the trainers. You know, I don't, I don't think Lenny McLean probably had, uh, Jesus, I shouldn't say that. It probably sounds very really disrespectful. But like, like I say, what I'm just saying, you know, maybe, and by the way, did you ever see the movie Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels? A long time ago. You got to it. Lenny McLean was, Lenny McLean played the role of the collector, the, the debt collector, you know, the, the, the boss, and the guys had to collect and bring the money back to him, but which was probably much of his real life anyway. But, um, I'm, I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to say that you've got to be intellectually uh, brilliant to be a good fighter. That's far from the case, you know. I mean, you know, most guys who are really great fighters who've never had a lesson in their life, 
you know, they're, they're not terrible. They're not on the higher level intellectual scale, you know. And I don't say that to be arrogant. I'm just saying that's the way it is. You know, and I teach a lot in Europe, you know, and, and uh, especially in Ireland. And they, they call them travelers over there. But they're, they're just, they're gypsies to you and us, you know. And um, these guys fight all the time. Uh, and they fight for money and they, they fight for honor and pride. And, and it's all bare, bare knuckle and, you know, and uh, it's all set up and, and uh, you know, these guys don't study, you know, here's how you check a left hand, you know, here's how you, here's how you jam a, a, a thigh kick, uh, you know, here's what you do in the case of being clinched. And, you know, they just fight, they, they just fight. And, um, but looking at it from this, from an art, and then trying to wrap it up into a tradition to pass on uh, this body of principles to other folks. And this is the so-called, you know, the, the like-mindedness of people who are attracted to this, these, these, these uh, common practices uh, are going to follow a pathway, which is in four parts. Uh, you know, the, the, the conditioning of the body, the cultivating the mind and the nurturing of the spirit. And it's all done through a set of uh, two person practices, which uh, lead to functionality. And, and, and as I said before, you know, the, the acts of physical violence that are habitual in human nature are quantifiable. And because they're quantifiable, they're easy to then to study and understand their dynamics, to learn why they're the way they are. The two-person drill, uh, which is a lengthy process, by the way. It's not, an, it's not, a very, it's not an immediate process. And, and I, that can be likened to something like, uh, how long would it take for your child to learn to ride a bicycle? Who knows? Maybe they need to be on a tricycle first, or maybe they need to be on a bicycle with training wheels and a little helmet and little elbow pads. And, you know, you need to use empowering language with them. Oh, Julie, you're doing very well. And, but maybe the other kid next door just jumped on the bike and they could do it right away. You know, So the learning curve is different for everybody, you know. But as long as the pathway is intact, that it, it ensures then that an alpha learner might be able to get it more quickly than, say, a, a better or theta learner, you know. And then, and then in the end, is you can take all of those uh, template-based practices and you can link them together into some type of geometry that produces something greater than the sum total of its individual parts. And therein lies the mystery of kanta. And, and so it becomes a wonderful uh, mechanism uh, of, uh, uh, of practice. And, or, or of training. Sorry. See, I, I, I learned it. I practice it because the practice makes perfect, so to speak. That's the lengthy process, you know. And then once I've mastered that skill, I can now train. And, and so, and so the form, the kata, the, the hyun, the, the punse, the taolu, whatever language you want to call uh, the tradition, uh, it becomes a, a fascinating mechanism of exploration. And, uh, and you know, how you do it when you're young and at the uh, apex of physical prowess uh, might not be the same way you can do it when you're my age, you know, um, with more physical challenges than you care to remember. But it still become, it still remains a wonderful uh, a practice. And, and it's a practice you can have across the spectrum of your life. You know, the, the, the apex of our practice is something called rei. Tegumi. And Riai Tegumi it really means, you know, taking all of these templates that you've learned across the year, the years, uh, and, and put them into, you know, like the Bruce Lee crossing hands. And then, uh, you know, you can start out shoving each other or trying to hit each other or knee or grabbing somebody or pulling a garment over their head or whatever it is you want to do. And there's, but there's a healthy respect between each person. And it would be no different from, uh, it would be no different from, let's say you're leading up to, let's say you're fighting, uh, uh, you know, you're fighting in, your, your, your fights uh, in April, and it's now uh, mid-February. So, you know, you've got like, you know, you got seven weeks left. So, you know, in that seven weeks, you're, you know, you're doing your road work, you're doing your weights, you're doing your stretching, you're eating a certain diet, you're listening, you're watching films, you're doing this, and but you're, you're ultimately in the ring. You know, you get your stand-up stuff, you get your clinch stuff, you get your ground stuff. And you're not beating the living shit on each other. <clears throat> you, you, but you are, but you are embracing each other with a certain degree of resistance. And, um, and you know, look, surely if I got an open shot, I headbutt him in the face. I, I knew I, I don't do that. And so the argument to the uh, critics is, well, that's not real fighting. Well, it's never real fighting anyway, is it? 
as long as there's rules and regulations, they're real fighting. And the truth is, and look, and I worked on the door of a lot of watering holes in, in my youth, and I, I was engaged in lots of real fighting. And the real truth is that sometimes the real fighting were pretty simple stuff. Other times it was really brutal, brutally messy and and never pretty like, oh, whoa, look, he, he knocked him out with a spinning heel kick. Now, that's entirely possible, but as a rule, that's not what happens, you know. And so I got guys in a, in a group that are, they're also, they're older than I am. And they love this two-person engagement stuff. And, 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 and some of them say, eh, you know, the legs, and the knees, and the hips don't work as well as they do, but I'm pretty good at you know, checking an impact and then we cap capturing somebody and then controlling them through a series of, you know, practices that I, that I love, whether it's, you know, whether it's taking the guy to the ground or whether it's, you know, bear hugging him and trying to, you know, put a, a rear naked choke on him or something like that, or whether it's just, you know, like grabbing him by the hair and biting his ear or something like, you know, it's, it's the, the, the movement is there. And it's like, you know, I, I also love Western swordsmanship, you know, and, and, um, with some of my guys there, it's like, well, we, you know, we, 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 we use, you know, hand and a half, single hand, bastard sword, buckler, you know, there's lots of different tools that we use, but the idea is that it's back and forth. And when you go to, let's say, engage with somebody, you know, you, you, you want to, you want to go back and forth for four or five minutes, you know, I mean, four or five minutes of swinging a sword at somebody and trying to hit them, you know, maybe, maybe not with full force or something like that. Uh, that's a hell of a workout, let me tell you. And re I take me by crossing hands with somebody and and going through the you know the the clinch and the trying to throw the guy to the ground or the guy not wanting to go to the ground and then and breaking free and throwing a kick at you you know it's it's a great practice you know and it's something that can be done in the same principle theory as rolling on the ground and um, those uh, traditional karate uh, folks with whom I have the pleasure of working with. Um, uh, I've really come to enjoy that. And, you know, I'll just, may I say this? Uh, back in the 90s, I, I'm sorry, I, I ramble, but this is, this is, no, so, this is so, no, this is, this is really interesting. So, so back in the 90s, in the early 90s, when I started this, and, you know, I got a lot of, I got a lot of steam, and I, I was so, you know, I just, whoever would have thought you could make a whole career on traveling the world teaching seminars. And that's, in fact, what happened. And, um, you know, I was turning jobs down because I just, I was so busy all the time. And, you know, and, and there was a time where, oh my God, I haven't been to that country. So I don't even care who's invited me. I'll go, you know. And, and, um, and then after a while, you know, you start targeting, you know, different groups and, and everybody want, and that's how the organization got formed in the first place and stuff like that. But the, 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 there was a, the only group on the internet in those days was a group called, uh, Cyber Dojo. It was called Cyber Dojo, headed up by a, an American guy named uh, Howard High. And, um, and I'll just cut to the chase. You know, I, you know, um, you know, they, he, he told me, so, oh, you know, when you want, just, just introduce yourself and, you know, say who you are, maybe what you've done. And, and, uh, and then, uh, and then, and then, you know, and, 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 a, and a dialogue will start and you can just join us. Okay, great. Now, I didn't. <laughs> I made the classical mistake of not reading first, getting the feel for my, uh, you know, uh, I kind of Sun Tzu's Art War 101 mistake, you know, and I'm, by not knowing both sides. And I went on, and at the time I was a seventh dan and I had a, and I had a Kyoshi li a teacher's license, Kyoshi's teacher's license. So I wrote and said, well, hi, my name is Patrick McCarthy. I live here in Japan. I'm I'm like a 40, 45 years old or something like that, or whatever, however, you know, and uh, I have a seventh degree black belt in this, and I'm a, I'm a licensed swords teacher, and I'm a uh, you know, licensed jujitsu teacher, uh, and uh, you know, I you know, boxed as a kid, I, and I and I, uh, you know, uh, uh, high school collegiate wrestler, and and blah, 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 you know, blah, 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 and I won all these championships, and I, you know, wrote these books, and I, you know, been on the magazine, and you know, I was, yeah, okay, that's about it. I think I think everybody get it, and I, and I posted it. Jesus, five minutes later, who the hell do you think you you're yeah in your dreams, buddy? You know, <laughs> and it started. You know, oh my God, that was a mistake. You know, but then I started. I went back and started reading, and and people would say, uh, "Hi, I'm Bob. I'm from Iowa. Uh, nice to meet you." <laughs> okay, I think that might have that might have been a little bit too much uh, too much of me there. You know, it's probably you know I couldn't erase it. I couldn't go back and say you know, I said, "Look, I'm really sorry." 
Uh, I just, I, I just assume, you know, that, uh, you know, you know, my job. I have a research organization. I'm, I'm happy to help uh, others who are interested in particular things. And <laughs> this, uh, oh, I, I was getting it from every angle, man. I, I thought that somebody was giving out prizes for how much they could attack me. And and the joke, the joke was uh, quoting the Iron Maiden here that uh, bastard McCarthy, you know. You know, if the bastard could, if the bastard could walk on water, it's because he couldn't swim. You know, <laughs> I did the love. And here's the now here's the joke in my group these days. So for all those guys old enough to remember, who, and I remember who they are, those guys who criticize me, that's not karate. There's no such thing. Two person flow drills. That's a joke. They, they, you know, he made them up himself, and they're now being congratulated for teaching what they criticized me for. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That's got to feel good. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's, and, and as I say, it is a joke. It, it really, I, it is a joke. Uh, whenever we have our world gatherings, and invariably somebody will bring this up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and better still is they will actually show me, you know, where they are online doing the exact drills. I remember, uh, don't, don't get me started. How long were we even talking <laughs> Holy smokes, look at that. <laughs> oh my goodness. I just looked at that. That's two hours. I was wondering I was wondering you if you were going for the title. Oh my god, I so, I'm so sorry. No, I thought it was like why? I was, why, why, why are you shopping. apologizing? No, this is no I was just what's thinking my job. Look, my job this? is to keep no, 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 you talking. Me a second, just... <laughs> <laughs> look, can can my job really thing? easy. No, but I was just going to say, you know, if, if you're editing up into 90 minutes, later, don't worry about it. You have lots of stuff to cut out. No, but, no you know, we don't I, edit. I, I, was, uh, I was just, I'm just looking at, as, I, as I'm looking at the screen, I can see that there's a, uh, there's a me uh, on the cover of a master's magazine there, okay, a, as my little uh, icon. Eh? So, so that, it just, I've been staring at it as I talk to you, you know, and it just reminds me of uh, the first time I worked with this gentleman. Uh, whose name is Val Mihailovich. He owns a Masters magazine and, and they have a big DVD company and, and, a, and, a, and a wonderful person, by the way. And uh, makes great magazines, make great DVDs. But, and he said, everybody who's anybody, probably like your show, you know, it's all, I had all these famous people. And I was very, uh, kind of like very, uh, not nervous or embarrassed. Or what was, what's the word I want? I just felt a little bit, um, Apprehensive, I guess, being in a studio for the first time and knowing knowing that you know, like like a couple of weeks before that there was like uh, Bruce Lee's wife, or, you know, sorry, former wife was there, and and you know, and then and then uh, and then uh, you know, Randy Couture. And, I mean, all these really famous people were there, and then there was like me, right? and I was like, Jesus Christ, I hope uh, you know, I I don't, I don't blow this opportunity. And then he goes, uh, uh, okay, Patrick, we're going to do this photo shoot. Uh, and then we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to sit there, uh, and uh, the camera's gonna be here, but it's a three camera shoot. So you, you, and if I, if I say, if I point there, just, just nonchalantly, just, just you know, like just look over as if you were thinking about something and talking to that camera. And then if you're over there, you see the red light go on. Just you don't have to, jack, you know, just, 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 just you know, are you okay with that? And I went, oh, okay, I'll try it. I said, well, what's the first one we're gonna shoot? And he goes. Uh, well, we're going to talk about this dynamo on Batoku Kai, and which was, was great because that's one of my favorite subjects. You know about uh, how karate got shaped into what it is. By the way, he goes, "Okay, so, so I'm going to start out. I'm just going to ask you the question, and you just 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 naturally talk, and then and then when, when I stop, I'll, I'll just I'll say, hey, I'll wait for a second, and I'll say, stop, a little bit of space in there, and then you take a breath, and then we'll go to the second question. Are we good? And I went. Yep. Yeah, I'm good. He goes, okay. And, and then he says, and, he, and uh, uh, you know, so we shot a few stills and I said, he said, just go to your favorite positions. I went, oh, I don't know, favorite position. I work best when there's somebody in front of me. He goes, okay. So, so I had my friend there and I said, my friend was back and, you know, doing, and I step like this and step like this. So the, the shot that appears on the cover of the magazine was just merely, it wasn't technically me standing in a pose. It was me moving it all the way of, uh, of my, of my partner at the time. And then I sat down. He said, "Okay, so, is, uh, Patrick, can I ask you a question? Um, tell me something about the dynamo and the guy." And I went, "Yeah, sure." Well, um, you know, and I started. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
there was there was actually even a part where he just walked away from the camera, and you know, uh, and he went into the office and had a cup of coffee. Yeah, I could see him through the window, you know, in, in the studio, and he came back out. I was still talking, and and then, and I, it was kind of like, and that's kind of so. That's uh, basically the thing on the Batal It was three hours. It was three hours mm-hmm. without a take, and I was looking on. And he goes, he said to me, he goes, you know, I got to tell you something. He said, I've had everybody and his brother in this studio. I have never had anybody do what you just did. Now, is that a good thing? He goes, it's, a, it's great. He said, he says, you really got the gift of gab, man. He said, you. And I said, well, yeah, I talked to a lot of people. And I said, you know, it's funny when I was a kid. And the first time I ever got on an airplane was in August of 1967 to go to the World's Fair. Uh, I, a lot of people don't know this. When I was a kid, I uh, baseball, I was a, very passionate about baseball. And we won the. Uh, uh, we won a, a, a Little League baseball championships in my little hometown, and then we traveled throughout my province and then the maritime provinces, and then we went to Montreal to the World's Fair uh, to to compete in the world, you know, the world. And you know, as an American, World Little League baseball championships a big deal, you know. And so we, by the way, we lost, so that's another story. But I said to my mom, I said, "Hey, mom, you know, I like when on my very first flight, I said." You know, I, I sat in the middle row and there was old people beside me and I didn't know what to say. You know, it kind of felt very, you know, so I just, I just, I kind of just said, hello, how are you? You know, I'm fine. How are you? You know, and I started a conversation. I said, what should I say to old people? And my mom said, oh, well, just be yourself. You know, just, just say hello. And, and it's nice to meet you. And where are you going? And why are you going there? And. How was life? You know, tell me something about. Can you give me a lesson? Yeah. You know, so, so from when I was re- so from really early age, I started having this dialogue with all these old people, which turned out to be really a, kind of a fascinating thing because you imagine, you know, you you kind of uh, think that uh, wisdom. Uh, now, this is not always the case, but you know, uh, the older you get, the wiser you generally become. You know, it's like you know, you kind of even if it's so your 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 own mistakes that you're learning from. You know, you usually have a lesson or two for people at old age, and so it was a great opportunity to to learn. And so I just found this uh, uh, ability to talk and and engage with people. Um, and so, you know, even here in Japan, you know, the Japanese are not very, when I, when I say they're, they're very, very friendly, but a, a Japanese will not go out of the way to come up and say, hello, how are you? They, they just don't do that. They're not, it's not a direct culture, you know, and, but I am, and I, and I'm, and I think in many ways, it's also been, uh, kind of an important part of my personality as well to be able to simply approach a person I don't know and say, wow, uh, you know, um, I watched what you did, or I read your book, or you know, I saw you on this film, or, or, and I just went, how the heck did you ever do that? What type of training or study did it, did, did it require for you to know what it is you know? I mean, I'm really interested in that type of thing. And it's worked out very well. So I'm just looking now, we started talking at eight o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. Oh, sorry, my time in Japan. That's yeah. two hours and a bit. So, uh, whew. Did well, I, a- I thought maybe <laughs> maybe you'd done some research and uh, and you noticed that Tony Blower had gone for it was like two thirty. Tony Blower, I know who that is. Uh, he's yeah. another Vancouver boy, isn't he? Just a minute, I believe Tony he is. Blower. Isn't Tony? Is he, yeah, Blower? he lives. He That's lives the in, Spears uh, guy, right? California. Yep. yep. And and yeah, had him it, on. It, this is like one oh eight. Okay, so, like, so I, I've never met him. By the way, I certainly know. Uh, Great guy, yeah. I know he's by reputation, uh, but I'll give an example. I there was a guy in Van, and I'm I'm also a Vancouver boy. But by the way, I, I ultimately wound up in Vancouver, which was my I consider my home these days. Although I'm from Saint John, Saint John the Brunswick, hey, the hood, the Rockwood Court. But um, in my early uh, years in Vancouver, I used to host a lot of seminars. You know, brought Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace. Uh, a professor Wally J. Rich, a lot of these guys up Danny Nasanto and people like that to, to teach at my dojo. And uh um I I I I got a guy who who is a police officer uh with a former background in the military, Canadian military, whose name was Al Arsenal. Al, if you're out there, I hope you're doing well, brother, and thank you for what it is you do and serving and protecting. Um and Al used to teach down at the barracks in the, in the Vancouver. And he used to teach uh, 
oh gosh, I'm struggling for I, Defendo or Defendu or something like that. And I remember, I, what the heck is Defendo or Defendu? And he goes, oh, it was a, it was a, it was a, an old guy. God, his name, I'm going to say, is it Bill Underwood? I, I could be wrong. That's the name that comes to my mind. Uh, Bill Underwood. I, I can't veteran. help you on this one. I mean, he was like a veteran of World War II or World War I or something. And I'm talking, this is in the late 70s now, you know, sure. uh, maybe 79, 80. And he said he he threw together some jujitsu tactics and he called them tricks. And uh, and uh, they and he introduced them to the Canadian military and it became part and parcel of a of a combative program that they used to run. And uh, and that, that and the program just got bigger and bigger and expanded and expanded and expanded. And that's where I heard the name Tony Blauer first time, because I think that Tony, and I could be wrong, and, I'm, and I stand to be corrected, please. Uh, I'm, I'm sure someone, some listener will correct me. But it just seems to me that I heard that name first is that was a bit of his lineage. He came from that lineage. And then he went on to explore functionality uh, against uh, dysfunctional uh, martial art type practices. I think he had a he had a, a synergy with law enforcement and the military as well. Yeah, and went on to create this Spears program, the Spears S P E A R S. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but I do remember it was about functionality. And uh, and he's he's developed that into a a templated based learning. He does he gives lectures, and he uh, uh, and he does hands on classes. And they develop some type of gear, right? Some type of a you can attack me at full blast yeah, or something. The, the yeah. high the high gear suits are his. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. which you've probably yeah. seen them. They're they're the black uh, versions of the red man suits. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I'm not. I'm not yeah. but that's why I know the name uh, Tony Blower, and I and I and I can I can tell you straight up. I've heard it. I've heard his name spoken with great respect in one area and not so much in another. Uh, the traditional guys seem to have a problem with him because uh, he uh, speaks about the dysfunctionality. Is that a word? Oh, I made that up. Uh, uh, the you know the the, the way I uh, you know I. Maybe he and I share the same belief on that. You know, this overly ritualized practices that would get you really harmed in a, a real fight. And um, so, yes, I know uh, I haven't heard his name in quite a while, but yeah, Tony Blower. Uh, so he went for how long did you say? It was, it was like two thirty. Yeah, we we got to. I mean, the, the style of the show was slightly different. I was a little bit more regimented than. You know, I, I'd kind of run down through the list of questions. Bloody well, Canadians, question eh? Three. He's a Canadian, you know, right? Tony's a Canadian, right? Yeah, I, I, believe, I believe he's. From he me. lives. He lives in California, right? He does. Yeah. I, I tried uh, living in California, by the way. Do you know? You know, I just left Australia uh, in August of 2019 after a very, very lengthy uh, immigration application process to fund myself my own. You know, I didn't have a sponsor. I funded myself. That was. Mm -hmm. Another story. I got my green card. You know, I got a, a F11 green card, IE11 green card. Uh, the, I think they call it the Hollywood green card. And and I went, I moved myself and my wife to DTLA. I live right downtown Los Angeles. And um, I don't know whatever compelled me to do that was the biggest mistake of my life. And, and then, of course, no sooner than we'd been there, you know, we all, we got all settled in and, you know, I was uh, starting my, my organization based out of there. And and I did a little bit of traveling, and boom, March, uh, COVID hit. And then, of course, the presidential election began. And, you know, all those riots that you saw uh, in DTLA, they were right in my neighborhood. Right from, my, from my condominium bill, I could look down and see those riots and gunshots and helicopters over my roof. I mean, I don't mean, like, near my roof. I mean, right over my roof for weeks. And, wow. and you know, even, even, even toward the end of it, even toward, you know, um, uh, September, October, November, you know, when the Lakers won the, their first game, you know, after the COVID, well, not, it was during the COVID, um, they destroyed downtown LA again, and they won. And then, of course, when the Dodgers won uh, the World Championship, they they destroyed downtown again, and, and a countless destruction, looting, violence was terrible. We, we, I just couldn't wait to get out of there. And uh, so uh, my wife is Japanese, by the way. She came back to Japan immediately. And, but I wasn't allowed to fly to Japan from America. So I had, being a Canadian, I was able to go back to um, Canada right away. 
And, uh, and I did, well, it was a lengthy process. To, you know, I just put everything I owned <laughs> into living in Los Angeles. Now I had to take it out again. So that, that's, there's a theme for another book, but I, um, uh, I went to Canada. I, I went to Toronto actually, and I, I prepared all my documents and, uh, went to the Japanese embassy. I had to do, I had to do a quarantine first and, uh, then a COVID test and go to the uh, Japanese consulate, present my case, you know, and, uh, my God, something happened that has never happened before. They granted me um, a visa on the spot. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. Never heard of wow. before. And I said, why, why, why am I getting this? And I said, well, there's, there's nobody's, nobody's going to Japan. So you're the only person who's coming to our office, in, you know, in months. So, <laughs> so uh, we can, all of us can work on your thing right away. And, and, uh, so, and, and, but then I, and then again, I had taken the COVID test to get on plane. And then, uh, and I got, when I got to uh, Tokyo, I flew into Haneda airport rather than to Narita and I had to get off the airplane. I couldn't, I couldn't interact with anybody. I had to take another COVID test and then another 14 day uh, quarantine. Fortunately, you know, my daughter, uh, she's a doctor, my son's a lawyer. They live in Tokyo. So they were able to, um, they had a colleague who was away and I could use their apartment for the two weeks I was there. And I got to tell you something. The, the and then I got on an airplane, flew to Okinawa, uh, which is where you know this is the island of where karate comes from. The lifestyle here is so slow. It's so peaceful. It everybody's mm. so friendly. The food is great. The people are friendly. It's it's far less expensive than it is in LA, and and it just sets a different vibe. And I just think, my God, I'm so happy to be here, you know. And, you know, at my age, I have fewer years ahead of me than behind me. I'm not sure. And, you know, certainly with the, the pandemic, we still have no idea. We really don't have any idea. Mm. Uh, well, you know, it, even what the vaccine is. I mean, that was such an unimaginable year. But, uh, we're you know, we've entered into another year, which is so far, you know, we, we haven't really been able to define yet, you know, how these guidelines are going to create, what kind of outcomes are going to create for us. And so we're still very, it's still very untenable times, you know, and, uh, uh, and I just, I feel for so many of my friends and colleagues who are, who have lost jobs, lost, lost loved ones. Um, they're just, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm changing the tenor of this conversation. I didn't mean to do that, but, uh, yes, sorry, Los Angeles. <laughs> Been there, done that. Don't apologize. No apologies <laughs> needed. No, it, it you know, it, at the beginning of the show, you brought up um, the actors. What, what, actors Workshop. The actors, yeah. actors Workshop. And yeah. longtime listeners know that inside the actor's studio is a big influence for me in the way I conduct myself on my interviews. You know, if you watch any of, of those, which is, uh, I, I was researching a little bit from my phone as you were talking, that looks yeah. like it was the precursor to the show that I watched. And who's the, the, host, who's the, who's the host? James Lipton. Oh, I, yeah. I'm so sorry. I made a mistake. Yeah, that's was that James, the one that you oh, meant? I'm so sorry. Yeah. I, my, my apologies. Oh, okay. You said the name Actors oh. Workshop. I should have made some notes or something. Well, there, there was an Actors Workshop. I, I, I'm oh, not familiar there? with it, but I I was googling, and and there was, and it seems was to be it? very similar. Yeah, and, and, was it also and James Charlton was Heston was ran through there briefly, from what I pulled up. So I, I, mean, I, well, I think you were right. You just didn't mean to be. <laughs> and if you if you look at James, Lincoln, the first time, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch the way he interviews, he he gets out of the way, and yes. the best example of that is the Robin Williams episode, where oh my God, yeah, where he talks about a two hour interview that they had to cut down to 30 minutes and it's 10 minutes before Lipton gets his first question out. I get it. Robin you Williams know, just goes. And you know, I got to tell you, he such it was such a beautiful person and such a tragic, tragic, yes. you know, a, a permanent ending to a temporary, uh, uh, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And it's just, so so bloody sad and what an absolutely brilliant brilliant human being robin williams was and and you know you, you think in terms of some of the best dramatic acting from a comedian and you try to determine what what, what was going on you know i worked a little bit in the film industry but just from my you know, 
yeah, from my angle, you know, as as a martial arts guy, you know, and uh, sure. uh, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, Vancouver was a, the reason why I actually went to Vancouver uh, in 1979 was because of a uh, a bill that uh, then our Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau had passed it was called Bill 88. It was a CRTC bill that allowed foreign countries to come into Canada and shoot their film or shoot whatever project it was at 100% tax write-off, providing they use 80% 80, 80 Canadian content. And that, of course, suit the American, uh, the, you know, in those days, of course, the Americans were the, were the, were the largest in the world, uh, the Hollywood film industry to come up. And all they need to do is bring the principals, you know, and then the director and the cameraman and the rest, the lighting, the food, the, 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 the supporting actors, the, um, the extras, um, all those crews and locations would be hired here in Canada. So Vancouver became the Hollywood of the North. And my partner at the time, she was, uh, she ran an, an agency called Talent Search Productions in Toronto. And, um, and her, her and her uh, business partner, Janet Milford, were, were going to, go to Vancouver to open up what they call, what we call Central Casting Canada, which we did, by the way. And, uh, and of course, I have my dojo at the same time there. And uh, so I had a, a, you know, a very organic and ground level opportunity to work in all kinds of different productions, you know, either as an extra or a special business extra or, 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 or you know, teaching somebody how to throw a punch or how to, you know, because in those days there, there were not schools as they are today to actively coordinate how a fight scene should go and you know there's a lot of argument from from real martial arts so that's not the way a fight would go and i said yeah you know maybe you're right but you don't understand uh you know camera trajectory and and depth of field you know so you don't have to hit a guy in the face to make it look like it and so on and they liked me for doing that and, and actually the, uh, why i came to this thought right now was you're talking about robin williams i the last film project i worked on uh, before I left Vancouver uh, for Japan was um, was called uh, Rocks Anne with uh, Steve Martin, and so I worked I worked five weeks on the set with uh, Steve Martin, and, and now, now here's a guy again who's a comedian, and yet the I worked with him for five weeks. If someone would not have told me he's a comedian, I would have never known it because he was so tuned into the idea of his uh, business and his banjo and his uh, his uh, investments and you know that was the first generation of uh, mobile phones came out in those days i don't know if you remember uh, uh um motorola came out with a telephone that was in it was like in a, in a little lunch can it was a it was a, this big monster of a phone and he was on the phone all the time making business deals and <clears throat> excuse me very very uh, much so serious and and I saw how serious he took being a comedian. And I thought, wow, man, that, that really takes a lot of work. And now you add Rob, Robin Williams to that. And I just, but just had amazing respect for that guy. And I did see that episode, by the way, but one, again, one of my favorites. And, uh, I can only imagine the, the task they would have had, uh, in the, in the editing department of, to put that into uh, the presentation. And I would think, you know how uh, Jackie Chan was made popular by uh, uh, putting his bloopers in the credits at the end, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and those making, are the best part and, of the movies. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I mean. And, and could you imagine have be a fly on the wall or 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 to have access to the, to those to what didn't make it in to a lot of those interviews, you know? That that would be that would be wouldn't that make for an interesting listen to? <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah. Well, who, thanks. Who, would, who wouldn't want to? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and you know, also uh, with the, um, I guess, I guess since uh, uh, since the pandemic started, and we have stopped our traveling around the world and our social gatherings, well, you know, reduced them, I should say, and and, and just displaced them to places like Zoom and and things like that. It's you know where where one door closes, another one opens. You know, um, and when you're trying to see the good side of a bad thing, um, and and you know, look at there's no there's no glossing over the um, horrific uh, and unimaginable 
death toll that this pandemic has delivered, and certainly the mismanagement of um, whoever may be responsible for for that mismanagement of of uh, setting guidelines and restrictions. And no, no finger pointing. I'm just saying, you know. Um, but but what it's done is it's given uh, birth to this Zoom type encounters, and um, I I'm not sure how many I've done of those this year. Um, or sorry, in this say this last twelve months. Oh gosh, it's this is February, isn't it? Next it is. next month will be one year. One yeah, wow, well, we, well, we we were talking about it a year ago now. Yeah, yeah, we were, wow. The question was so, when when was it going to reach where where you were, wherever yeah. that was. Wow, yeah, man, it's pretty pretty deep stuff. I don't just you know, I'm 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 still thinking about and thinking of all the all the stuff that's transpired and all the. Oh, anyway, wow, that's, I'm sure, you know, I, I, no, no question, when they get back to making films, this will certainly set the groundwork for a film uh, that'll be, you know, hey, by the way, talking about films, and I was just thinking about, you know, I was, the other day I was over at Hacksaw Ridge, you know, um, here in Okinawa, and everybody knows Hacksaw Ridge because of the movie, but it, it's so surprising, and you're talking about you know, catastrophic things happening, and um and like, you know, with the pandemic, it, it, I, I don't mean to say it wasn't catastrophic, but like, for example, a bomb didn't explode. It, nobody, nobody launched a missile at us or, you know, it, it has been such a quiet war, you know, so to speak. And, uh, but, but so many lives have been lost to, you know, I was over, uh, I went to Urazori uh, Gusku Atto, which means uh, the castle ruins of Urazori, and I completely forgot that the castle ruins one part of it, that that sheer cliff coming up, which is all covered now with jungle and snakes and stuff like that, that was that's Hacksaw Ridge. And when I look, when I walked down there and looked up at them, and there's there are monuments there, uh, you know, uh, to commemorate the lives lost on both sides, you know, and and the and and the the catastrophic engagement that existed there. And I, I had a ch- had an opportunity to actually speak to someone who was there, and uh, and and another guy whose name is Evan Newson, who's a who's a um, civilian uh, war historian who once lived here in Okinawa, and now we're just in Kanta. He's, he's actually out in the Pacific Northwest right now, and we talked about the battle that raged on there. I thought to myself. God, I said, that's something because it was so explosive. And, and, and you see the, I mean, the Hacksaw Ridge is less than the size of a football field. It's, uh, it's not, so what's a, a fit, football field is what, 50 yards, 100 meters, something like that? Uh, sorry, uh, 100 yards, uh, 100 meters, something like that? So imagine, okay, so not, that's 50 yards or 50 meters. That's how and arguably not even that wide, put it up on a, put it up on a, on a, not a 90 degree angle. It's probably, it's probably more like a 45 degree angle. Or something. That's how steep it was. And the rock is, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to use the word limestone because limestone can be shaved and made into nice smooth. This stuff is like a coral reef rock. I mean, if you're just walking on the wrong way to cut your foot, can you imagine trying to scale this thing with machine guns going off? And, mm-hmm. and, and I've just read this. How, but, you know, that's catastrophic, and you can kind of get your hands around, you know, understanding it. This pandemic, the, 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 you know, the enemy is, uh, it, it's, it, it's not biased. It, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a, a, an ethnicity to it. Although, you know, a lot of people want to say it's Chinese, but it, and, and, and that may be so. I'm just saying it doesn't have a face, so to speak. And it can, it doesn't know, it doesn't, it's not biased. It doesn't listen to race or religion or, 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 or financial position or monetary gain. It just, it just, it's terrible. And how we are going to end this uh, pandemic and, you know, you know, I remember when this first, I said, oh my goodness, pandemic. When was the last time we had a pandemic? I Googled it and I thought, oh, look at that. That was the, uh, what was it, what was it, was it the, the pandemic of, was it the Spanish flu or the, the yeah. uh, 1918? 1919 uh, was it? And it was like, what was it, 4 yep. million lives? And I'm thinking, wow, this is the 
yeah, well, this is the 21st century. That's not going to happen here, you know. And, and now, and now, what are we looking? Are we looking at two million already? Uh, we just passed half a million here in the U.S. Yeah, just just but, in the states, half a million. My yeah. God, it's like you know, when when is this going to stop? And you know, I'm so you know, I look at my fingers every day, and they're you know they're you know the cuticles are getting raw from wash. I wash my hands so many times every day because I'm out a lot. You know, I, I'm either I have to go down to shop and uh, or I have I, I'm down at the dojo or. You know, I'm on the, I, I love, uh, you know, uh, going out the parks or going down to the oceanfront. And I'm on an island, so it's not that big to start with. I can be at the oceanfront and on a mountain or on a historical site all in a morning, for example, you know. And uh, and to get there, I either have to drive or I have to take the monorail to get there or I walk. And, you know, uh, so I've, I've always got the stuff to clean my hands and, and I'm wearing my mask. I actually wear two masks. And, and, uh, you know, I still see people walk around with no mask on. And, I, and I'm thinking, my God, I said, well, you, you know, you know, how about if somebody just sneezes in front of you? Or, you know, I, I, I hate getting in elevators. And, and I said, am I, do I want to continue living? And, and, you know, my friends who are still in North America, and one in particular, who's extremely successful in his uh, uh, karate schools, this, this guy's got 50. 15,000 members of uh, students wow. and uh, yeah 15,000 wow. in the in the US no in Canada in, in Toronto Canada. yeah sounds like someone and, we need to have on the show I would I would be happy to make an introduction if yeah, you like that'd be great. may I may I say his name on, on uh please Obama? please do yeah his name is Caesar Borkowski and he's from Toronto and I know him very well we're around the same age we came up through the ranks together, and uh, he he is uh, in my in my opinion he's kind of like the answer to uh, management of modern karate. Here's how you um, here's how you package modern karate into a functional a functionally effective tradition, but keep it as a valuable uh, heritage a, a, a legacy. A, a, uh, and and representing the, the 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 legacy of the pioneers, and, and and put it into a safe training environment with with teachers who really know what they're talking about, and and, and keeping on top of the pedagogical point, and, and also from a business a model. There, there's just there, I've never met anybody like this guy anywhere in the world, and he's highly respected uh, by I, 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 arguably even his detractors have a hard time uh, knocking this guy. You know. Mm-hmm. But they are hurting, and and uh, and I know I know the type of guy he is. Uh, he's, in, you know, if I have, I can liken this to a family. He's the paternal role model of his organization, and the, he would rather go without just to make sure that someone else has. And he's a classic example of we and us and. Uh, and not me and I type of thing, you know. And uh, I bet he'd make, I bet he'd make a, a great, uh, I, I bet he'd make a little bit on the modest side. I don't think he'd, <laughs> you might have to ask him more questions. He wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't talk as much. But I, I, I would definitely, you know, please, uh, and if you want, I'll yeah, send Yeah, I just, I just made a note. We'll, we'll. Uh, and by the way, there's lots of, lots of other guys I know as well. I'm are, sure. You know who are just absolutely wonderful. You know they they might not all be using the same yardstick to measure of their value uh, uh, in life or as a contribution to this fighting art, but they're equally and uh, alternatively uh, uh, great people who offer uh, wonderfully valuable insights into empowerment. You know, and uh, I had a I had a guy uh, approach me not not so long ago. Well, so it was a year before last. At election, he goes, "Oh, yes, yes, so oh, oh, this is uh, sounds like Tony Robbins a lot." Went, yeah, great Tony Robbins. I love him. I especially loved him in the Shallow Hal. You know, it was one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and I, by the way, I have students of mine, actually Canadian students, who are actually personal friends of Tony's. You know, and and uh, they oh, go cool. to they go down to Fiji to his his thing there every year. And but but you know, Shallow Hal was the best. And it was great. But Noah, I said, well, you know something. Uh, I was a terrible uh, student in school, by the way. I was, and I, incidentally, I was a, I was a high school dropout, and um, and never went back to school until I was an adult. Uh, but I went back with a passion and a target, you know. So, and you couldn't stop me then. But um, 
I, just nothing. There was nothing that really uh, captured my attention in school, you know. Uh, and I can tell you on one hand the things that I do remember. Most of it was my sporting. You know, very passionate about gymnastics and wrestling and football and, and baseball, and of course, of course, you know. And um, and uh, I uh, pas français, de Bernard. I loved my French teacher. And that's a that's a story I private will tell you about another time but <laughs> and uh yeah no, we won't go there but and and um and i love i love uh i love the the uh theater arts you know and uh and the only reason i even bothered took it because i thought it was just a bunch of sissies who did that you know um and i define that in a very different way than you might think it came out um but one of the reasons why I liked it was it was because a chance for me to kind of fool around. I was always a clown, a clown, a class clown, you know. So, and I was going to get, I was going to get credit for it. So I went, oh, this is great. This is way better than doing math or algebra, you know. And um, and I remember uh, my teacher said to me, uh, you know, Patrick, you you got to write a report on this. And I said, I said, I thought we didn't have to do that in this class, you know. I said, there's no, look at, there's a lot of it is you know hands on and and but you've got to you know you've got to. Okay, so the two things I remember most about her class were the two books I had to read. And isn't it fascinating now? 50, more than 50 years later, what sticks in my mind, other than my French teacher, <laughs> ever changed, was, uh, <laughs> ooh, and I would never report her. Are you kidding? Wow, that's, I would never away, man. <laughs> and um, was these two books I read. One was called The Crystalids. A crystalis, and the other one was called As a Man Thinketh. And the crystal, the funny synergy about those two books, completely different uh, in nature, uh, sorry, in, in definition, but almost identical in principle. The crystalids were about, you know, it was about uh, aliens and transformation type of thing, right? Uh, but what I didn't realize was that this wasn't really about it. They were using aliens and invasion to describe people who thought differently uh, about that which there is to understand. And that thinking differently was not a bad thing, it was a good thing, you know. And it had measured the strength of character. And the other one, this called book, uh, book was uh, called uh, As a Man Thinketh, was written by James Allen, who's a Victorian writer, who made perfectly clear that when he wrote the book, which, and you could read it in a half an hour. Yeah, you know, I read a book in a bathroom this morning. I love reading, by the way, you know. And uh, I... Uh, and James Allen made sure that the book did not have a copyright so that everybody could take it and plagiarize and use it because he really believed these words to be timeless lessons. And I suppose because there's a bias on as a man think, you know, it's kind of is discriminatory. Had, had, but that was part of Victorian culture, by the way, as well. Had James Allen lived in the 21st century, that book would have been called As a Person Think of. And it's all about the inward journey, you know, about, like I said, the warrior's journey. Uh, that book, the words jumped off those pages when I read it. And I've, I've, I've probably read it a hundred times in my life, you know. And, uh, yeah, I could play all the parts to myself, you know. And and uh, and, and I'm, I have a very photographic memory with regards to things like that. Another thing I didn't know about in high school, by the way. wish I would have known that. I could have applied it then. And um, so it's you, you, you either wake up or discover or are taught that there's something greater in life uh, than, and you can aspire to it. And there's a pathway to follow it. You gotta find it. And that's the journey. And then once you find it, there's another journey on top of that. And then there's all this adversity that you're gonna run into, and that defines your character. And the adversity is the lesson. And then there's the empowerment part. And then there's the giving it back as a gift to, to others less fortunate. That's what as a man thinketh what about. And that had a very profound impact upon my my young my life as a young person. And when I listen to guys like not just Tony Robbins, but a lot of speakers like him, and there's a few other Canadians who are, uh, he's not Canadian, by the way, but there, there are a few other uh, people who, uh, a couple of Canadians who, who've, uh, who've thought and uh, expanded upon the same timeless principles uh, as James Allen. And when I listen to Tony Robbins, I, I just think that's James Allen. It's just, it's James Allen uh, being reinterpreted uh, to address the same timeless problems that we have in life through a lack of identity and insecurities and fear without enough love. Uh, and, it, and, 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 and so I tend to look for that through the historical uh, 
uh, research, uh, who used that in the fighting arts to balance the physicality of this brutal killing art to create such beauty as in not killing people. You know, I mean, you think about it. It doesn't matter what you do, judo, karate, kung fu. Judo. I mean, we're really practicing. While it may, in fact, be a non-lethal art with empty hands type of thing, you know, it certainly can be lethal. And how do you, how does one create a, a, a set of guidelines or a body of principles or a moral philosophy that serves to govern the behavior of people who would, in other words, without that type of uh, mentality, use that to harm people, you know, or be just a little more than a thug. And there's lots of people like that, you know. And there are some traditions that, that emphasize that type of mentality, and none of which I'm a part of, of course, you know. But the, And I think that that's, that in itself is yeah, just another part of an area of study that doesn't get as much press, I suppose, if I can use that term. But now with this, as I was alluding to earlier, the Zoom thing because of the pandemic has, you know, it's kind of opened a new door for folks to look through and, and, and for folks, and I I myself am technically retarded. You know, I don't, uh, I'm not good at, uh, you know, these uh, kind of platforms. I have no problem talking about them, but I just said, you know, I don't know how to set them up myself. And it's something that's uh, on the uh, on the agenda for me now, getting settled here in Okinawa, is I'm going to put a lot more time into uh, this type of platform. And so when I get the privilege or the opportunity to speak to someone like yourself, uh, and I know, you know, this is a, you know, it's kind of hands-on, it's free, it's, uh, it's you know, it's uh, being recorded. So it's going to be there for posterity. Exactly. I hope to God that I can say something that's halfway intelligence that uh, that might help inspire someone else who's listening to say, other than this guy flapping his lips, uh, you know, for three hours, he said something. <laughs> he said something that you know inspired a, a deeper consideration of something else that I might go back and look at, or or I might go back and look at, say, the actors' workshop or the you know the in the actors' studio, or or or, uh, or look at Charles Huston talking, or or, or looking at the, you know. Uh, Bushi Matsum or Gichin from the coach here, or whoever it was. I call those guys gatekeepers, by the way. After a while, their names are not so important as is their message, you know. And, and because, you know, they, you know what they say, history repeats itself, you know, but, and, you know, if you're, if you're really smart, you, you know, you can learn the, the mistakes that history has recorded. And, um, and I think that's why the study of history is such a valuable practice. And, you know, I often get, well, what, how is that going to help me in my business? And I said, you know, everything's not always about you. It is. If I don't have any money, I, I can't live. And I went, yeah, something. I think your health is more important than the money, okay? And so why don't you focus on your health first? And then when you're really healthy, it's probably easier to, to you know, negotiate that stress uh, and frustration that's associated with not being able to get any money. There's a, you know, it's funny how many happy people you meet that don't have any money, you know, and it's 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 equally uh, to the opposite. Intriguing to find out how many rich people are really fucking stressed out, man, you know. And so, you know, that, and the, hey, hey, there's a topic for another interview sometime. <laughs> I, I, we've got a long list of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but anyway, look, at, and so, so like I say, I, okay, I'm not going to apologize for taking all the time, but don't apologize. was there actually a question? No, <laughs> no, because, no. no I, I think it stemmed body. from hi, and we started <laughs> yeah. chatting, and you just you went, you went. But why? See, here, here's here's my theory, and, and I get a lot of positive feedback on this. Yeah, sure. I see my job as to facilitate the guest telling their story. Yep. You made my job really easy today. <laughs> Yeah. I just hung well, out. I, Listen. Yeah, no, I get that. Thank you. By the way, thanks. I take that as a compliment, by the way. And you know, I, and, I, and I do too. I mean, you were comfortable enough to to do that. All too often, I don't know how often you listen to podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Most of our hmm. listeners listen to other podcasts as well. And hmm. you get a lot of hosts who are very egocentric, and they can't get out of the guest oh. way. Oh, you know, right. and, and we 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 had a, you know. I, I make sure that I chime in quietly to let you know that I'm still here. But beyond <laughs> that, I, I didn't I didn't see any need to interrupt. What okay. am I going to ask you that you're going to want to talk about more than what you were just talking about? And when someone talks right. about the yeah. things that they're passionate about, 
you're going to get the best mm. stuff out of that. I could steer you in a different direction, sure, yeah. but what sure. if that's not a direction you want to go? Yeah, that's arrogant yeah. on my part as an interviewer. So I just get the hell out of the way. Well, you know, it's funny that I, 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 I'm so organic with this stuff. You know, and I always kind of uh, I'm uh, I, I respond and think about things. It's like you know the it's like the defense to the offense. Uh, you know, a, a, a defense is slower than an offense because someone's already taken the initiative to attack you. So, you know, if you're if you're lucky enough to have the attacker in front of you, you can see it. That's a luxury, by the way, you know. And how you respond to it depends largely upon, you know, what your experience is. And, and when you were just talking, the first thing that came to my mind, and so I speak uh, 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 Japanese, by the way, you know. And um, in Japanese, there's a, there's a kind of a, we have a culture called a tate mai honne, and it's, uh, it's a long explanation. It's kind of like a, you know, the Japanese are, always a kind of a they have a facade they're, they're always a certain way you know they're always very polite and and even if they see meet somebody they don't particularly like they'll be polite to the person and, and the honne means the truth you know it's the opposite of the face you know it's the it's the truth never to be seen unless you're angry or drunk type of thing, you know but on, on both cases you get a pass by the way and so um and so uh when a when a when a senior is speaking to a junior it's not the junior's place to uh, question or talk or interrupt, but they have come to something called aizuchi. And an aizuchi is, uh, how can I best explain that in English? An aizuchi means it's kind of a, a verbal, a verbal acknowledgement, responsibility of the listener to make every once in a while that lets the talker or the speaker know that they're listening and they're paying attention. So it would be something like, in English, it would be something like, oh, so, so first, of, first of all, if I was listening to you in Japanese, I would make these types of noises like, like that. That's like an Aizuchi, right? Mm. And uh, in English, it would be like, yeah, yeah, ah. Uh, oh yeah, 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 like that, right? And so that's the first thing I thought, and I said, "Yeah, that's kind of like really important, right?" Because it helps the flow and synergy of uh, of the engagement. And the second thing was, you know, about uh, you know, like uh, arrogance, right? And so, so I'm long, many, many years ago, still, still in the late '80s, early '90s, I was doing a research project, and the the um, the focus of my intention was uh, the uh, why is it some people have such a problem uh, with accepting certain lessons and certain manners of training, and uh, and the the I had come into contact with a few of these old pioneers, long gone by the way, you know, and I was just studying their work, but I was studying it in a second language, and I was not so. I was not, I didn't have a control over the language then as I do now, uh, particularly with the written form, you know. And I learned that uh, the old style Chinese, which is what the Japanese and the Okinawan spoke back, uh, sorry, read back in the old days, we call it Kanbun, you know, Kanbun, Chinese, Chinese. And uh, they speak in such a flowery way, you know, and they never kind of, you know, we we are, we live in a very functionally direct, uh, you know, hey, fuck off, uh, eat this, uh, go there. Do, you know, you, you say what you mean, you mean what you say. There's no, you know, I, hmm, what does he mean when he said that to me? You know, you, you can get it right away. And, sure. But, but uh, Japanese is not that way, you know. It's really, it's really the responsibility of the listener because of a mistake's made. It could never be the speaker's mistake, you see. It had to be the listener's. Oh, you didn't understand what I said. So so I, I was studying this guy's name, uh, whose name was his, uh, it was family name first here, right? So I'm Patrick McCarthy. In Japanese, it would be McCarthy Patrick. I was studying the, the work of this guy named Matsumura Sokon, Bushi, Bushi Matsumura. He's like the... Uh, He's like the uh, he's like the Miyamoto Masashi of Okinawan karate, right? And uh, he he was born eighteen oh nine, died at, died in eighteen ninety nine. He was a very the most popular martial artist of his time, and, and and anyway, that's a topic for another story. But and he, and I was trying to he left these writings uh, eighteen eighty two. He wrote the uh, Seven Principles of uh, Martial Arts, and then he and then in eighteen eighty five he wrote uh, something called Zayu no Mi. I don't even know how to say that in English. You know, it's um, it, I guess it's like a maybe a kind of a an extension of, of a proverb or a saying or a metaphor. You know, kind of like how to live life type of thing. You know, uh, like a, his wisdom. You know, anyway. 
And what I got from it was, I got it now. I got it now. It's, it's like, he said, here's the problem. He said, he said, for those whose progress is hampered by ego-related distractions, <clears throat> let humility, I'm just going from memory here. Let, let humility, the cornerstone upon which the fighting arts rest, serve to remind you to place virtue before vice, values before vanity, and principles ahead of personalities. Hey, I remember that great. <laughs> and, and, you know, I thought to myself, wow. And what was I, what I found most uh, interesting about that, uh, those, and by the way, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, paraphrasing. He did not say that directly. That's my interpretation of what he meant, because, you know, all the historical experts who will listen to this say, that's not what Matsumura said. And I agree, it's not what he said, but I think that's what he meant. And, you know, when you translate, there's also a, an interpretation. My wife is a inter professional interpreter, by the way. Uh, you know, she used to do simultaneous interpretation for diplomats and stuff like that. And, you know, there's a kind of a law of ethics in interpretation. You're not supposed to, uh, sorry, as a translator, you're not supposed to interpret what he said, you're supposed to translate what he said. So let's say that you know the person, you know the bias. You're not supposed to share that bias with the listener, so to speak. I'm not, <laughs> I don't go for that type of thing. I, I think you should, you know, you know, let it all, the, the responsibility of a, of a scientist in a discovery is to share that with the next generation. That's how we progress in life, you know. And so I, I think the, the wise thing about what Matsumura said there uh, and what, what that meant to me was, He's speaking about timeless principles. So the principle itself doesn't change. You know, the, the straight line, it doesn't change. You know, mass times acceleration, it doesn't change. You know, flexion, extension, pronate, supinate, deviate. Th these, these things, these timeless uh, sciences, they don't change. And, or if they do change, it, it's, it becomes a phenomenon, you know. And, um, and uh, so, so I thought, oh, that, what I loved about what he said is that message is as valuable now than it was 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. And it will be continually valuable into the unforeseeable future. Who doesn't want to embrace that? And then uh, <laughs> my accountant said to me, he says, well, you know, Patrick, you know, can't all live on bread alone. He said, he said you, will think, you will find that the oligarchs of this planet don't necessarily think in an ethical way that you would like them to. There is something called power, greed, and control. And <laughs> I said, don't get me started, man. I said, I, I don't have any problems sleeping at night. <laughs> I'm, uh, you, know, you, you know, we were talking about this thing earlier, about change is the only thing uh, inevitable in life. And, and uh, I got to tell you, man, I, I am so far out of shape right now. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> and I got to juggle. I'm like a... a, a the dishwasher, the, the bottler, maker, and the, the cook and the chef all at one time here, you know. And this last, at least this last one year, oh, my God, frightfully drastic for me about, you know, getting out. And and, uh, and, and another thing about the COVID, I cannot wait to get back in the dojo and get down on the ground and, and start training with people again, you know, because it's just the solo thing is really, really difficult. You know, you're continually searching for... Hey, well, I thought you were an expert. <laughs> you know, you know, us strong people shed some tears from time to time too. We also need our motivation, and you know, oh, we need our we need our heroes uh, to be heroes. We don't want to know that they're just human beings and frail too. You know, so uh, I thought, you know, I'm just, you know, they, I'm dying to get on the ground and roll. With I'm dying to get in and spar with somebody. I'm dying to. Just hit some focus mitts, for God's sakes, you know, and, and have an up-close, personal encounter with somebody at the dojo. And I don't know when that's going to happen. And and you're you're on top of this. You speak to people all the time. Is that going on anywhere else right now? Um, what are people doing? Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know. It, a bit. Hmm. You know, I, I, I myself am ready to do it immediately. And uh, with the, some of the people I have here in Okinawa, they're, they're ready to do it too, you know. And I get other people saying, you know, look, hey, what, you know, hey, listen, listen, who are you working with? I said, look, I am not symptomatic. I, I, I wear a mask. I exercise social distancing. I wash my hands. 
and I, I am not positive. I, and I know that uh, my friend, James, he's the same way. Uh, but, oh, my God, wait, wait, wait. Oh, uh, Bob is married with four kids. And Bob's kids are in school or they're not in school or they're playing with kids. And, you know, it's entirely possible that uh, something's been transmitted. Bob doesn't even know he's got it. And I'm rolling with him. I'm doing this and bang, next thing. And, oh, three days later, I'm like coughing. And, and like I said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, in the, I'm in the most susceptible category. You know, uh, I'm past retirement age. I'm carrying, I, I, I say this lightly, a few extra pounds. Uh, and I have, uh, you know, I have a, a, a respiratory, uh, I have asthma as well. Mm. So, I mean, that, that may, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the prime candidate, you know. And so as much as I would love to get back on the ground and do that, you know, I, I, go, over the, I go over to the Nami Nui uh, uh, waterfront. And I walk the beach in the morning. Or I'll go into the forest. I got to be careful there because of the snakes. But you know, this is—it's um, a little bit. When I say a little bit cold here, <laughs> for you it wouldn't be cold. <laughs> for you, this would be a summer's day. <laughs> but uh, but you know, uh, and I'm on Celsius, not Fahrenheit. So, but for example, you know, we've had ten degree days. Uh, you know, ten degrees Celsius. I don't know. I don't know what that. Uh, would I'm, be. I'm wearing a t-shirt in 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 your ten degrees. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. And I'm a Canadian. And and I I ten degrees is nothing. For, Fourteen degrees, uh, people are all bundled up with scarves and hats. You know, going, I'm in shorts and shirt. You know, going, what's wrong? You know? But but the point being is, when I walk, I can I can walk in the forest or in, in the woods now because uh, the, it's cold and reptiles cannot come out in the cold. You know, and I lived in mm. I lived in Australia for twenty years. Let me know. I know all about poisonous snakes. And here in this in this island, we have a snake problem, and, and they're called habu snakes. And they're poisonous as well, and they'll kill you. And uh, like, I can't get my friends walking in the forest. I said, like, come on, it's, it's too cold. They go, this is not cold. It's 20 degrees. I said, you know, for a snake, it's cold. <laughs> so the, the snakes don't want to come out until it's, you know, 25, 30 degrees. You know? So I said, we're still safe. And, you know, I'll go out to Shuri Castle, which burned down last year, by the way. And, or I'll, I'll go to this, this uh, there's a, something called Haka. Haka here are tombs. And um, they have a very, very interesting shape, which uh, resembles the bosom of a mother, by the way, as well. And they're, they're hundreds and hundreds of years old, obviously those ones that were not destroyed during the world. And uh, because of the, the, the Confucian-based uh, culture here, um, the, the, and, and their Buddhist beliefs, they go and they go, the families will go at certain times uh, over the year to visit the tombs and, you know, open the tomb and, you know, take the take the urn out and clean the bones and that type of it's a it's a it's a religious uh, spiritual process here. But there's lots of guys like who are really famous martial art masters. Like the other day, I was I, I told you I was on the Hacksaw Ridge. I was there actually to yeah. visit the uh, Haka, the tomb of uh, Miyagi Chojin. Remember the Karate Kid that was supposed to be mm -hmm. about the Mr. Miyagi. Well, well, Miyagi Chojin was the founder of uh, the pioneer of Goju in Karate. So he's buried up there. So I went up there to pay my respects and run a couple of kathas, uh, you know, in, in front of this tomb there. And, and then, you know, and then uh, um, um, I went down to a place called Makabi, and Makabi's got a bunch of hakas there, you know, and there's one from Ito Sokanko, another one from Bushi Matsumura, this guy I just told you about. And I'll go down there and I'll take a little old bento with me and I'll, and I'll sit around and read the, you know, read the history on his, on his epithet and, you know, maybe do a couple kata and, uh, you know, the odd time I bump into other people who are crazy like me and they were down there as well. Or, you know, the other day I drove up, I went up north, I went up to, um, well, I went to Yomitan, then I went to Nago, and, you know, it was a cherry blossom season. It's very early here in Okinawa compared to the mainland. And so we went up to look at the cherry blossoms, and we visited Nakajin Castle. And, and on the way up, my, my friend said, hey, did you know that uh, Matsumura Kosaku, his name sounds a little bit like Bushi Matsumura, but one is Matsumura, the other is Matsumura. And uh, he said, you know, his hawk is right here. I said, oh, God, I didn't know that. So we stopped off and spent an hour there, and, you know, and and so 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 I'm still pretty mobile, you know, getting around and doing a lot of things every day. And uh, there's so many beautiful places on the island to to visit. So I'm I'm staying active, but you know, I just relocated here a couple of months, three like less than three months ago, and uh, we still haven't found a house to buy yet. 
And mm. so, and it's a great buyer's market right now, by the way, because, you know, I have a couple of properties in, uh, in Australia that I sold before I went to the States. And um, so, you know, I got all that money sitting in a bank account. And uh, so we're ready to, we're ready to buy another place. We just haven't found one, you know, we don't want to buy something and realize it was the wrong place. So we're living, we're just living in this uh, kind of a, they call it a one LDK, one bedroom apartment. And we've just found a house now uh, down in a place called Tomiguzuku. And, uh, and we're, so we're going to go live there. It's, a, you know, so it's like a five bedroom house. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's much nicer. And, you know, by American standards, it's not so expensive, maybe like 1500 bucks a month. And, and so we'll, we'll live there while we continue to explore the island and, and find a place to live. And, and, but it's much closer to the ocean down there. So you don't have a nice opportunity to get on to walking and stuff like that. But I'm 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 dying to get back to training that type of thing. And and um, I don't mean to turn this around and become the interviewer, but you're obviously a martial artist <laughs> as well. I am. You too. What do you practice? I am. Yeah. Um, everything I can get my hands on. Good. I, I yeah. consider myself style agnostic. Grew up in karate. Yeah. Uh, played in a bunch of different things. You know some. Some judo, a little bit of judo in there, different styles of karate, some capoeira, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and in here in Vermont, you know, some kempo, some taekwondo. And right. uh, I've been fortunate enough to connect up with uh, kickboxing uh, under Bill Wallace. <laughs> I as, as a result twice. of the show. Did you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. You, you got yeah, no, to tell me about right. that. My, my apologies. Uh, my apologies. Uh, sorry. Exhibition fight uh, with the. Uh, sure. And, um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Billy's, I mean, and you know, I don't know if you, you probably know this uh, training under him, but you know, long before, uh, let me see if I get my dates here. Long before September 1974, and Mike Anderson's first BKA, where he became the champion, um, he was a, he had been a remarkable uh, point fighter. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, uh, background physical education and uh uh best hamburger eater in the world <laughs> you know and, and just such a such a great guy you know and and um uh, yeah no i yeah i had a chance to uh, and and you know look at the a guy who had mentored me as a fighter uh in canada his name was wally sloki and uh, uh wally was another personal friend of yeah. bill did, he, he, i'm, gonna, I'm bill. gonna interrupt you for the first did you know that they fought an exhibition match yeah in sure 19 yeah, yeah. I, I i i know that very very well in fact in <laughs> fact not every people people are gonna think I, i'm i'm getting the dates wrong that that these these two you know, no, gentlemen no, no, who, uh no, I, no 2019 I, you can find the video sure well i mean look look i i look at i, I i'd seen wally a couple of times during during the time he was preparing for the bout, uh, like you know, he and I are friends for oh gosh, fifty years. Oh, cool. and, he uh, seems like a great guy. Ah, uh, Wally, another guy you should interview. He's a walking encyclopedia man of all the information, and especially from the from the sixties and early seventies. And uh, and uh, but but the the promoter of that was Jean Tarien, uh, uh, who is another remarkable person, uh, who's uh, uh, with his World Kobodo Federation and in uh, in uh, in harmony with Cesar Brokowski, by the way, the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame, uh, these two functions were brought together, and it was uh, you know it was a, it was a kicks for kids. Uh, uh, the the uh, the funds that were uh, generated went to the Children's Foundation from that fight, and yeah, of course I knew very well, and I, I knew the cameraman who shot it. I knew the referee was in. My, I knew uh, Johnny <laughs> Terrio, who was the other guy who did the other exhibition fight as well, and you know the Ice Man, and um, sure, and and as a normally I would have actually been there myself. You know, I'm a, I was inducted into the Canadian Black Hall of Fame myself, but uh, you know one of the things about doing what I do is I travel a lot, and often you know the events overlap uh, previously engaged in. Uh, engagements for me and i you know i wasn't even able to go for my own <laughs> award ceremony but yeah yeah no i know uh, yeah, wally and bill fought each other yeah certainly right and uh but i mean what a you know and i look back across history you know just like my own history and i think you know what a great opportunity it's been to what a wonderful uh, mm. 
uh, life it's been to, you know, to walk and train in the same dojos as these guys, let alone to fight, you know, be in a ring with them. And, and uh, I, I think this is all, this is all maybe heading for another book one of these days. You know, I've written nine books and, uh, and uh, people keep, when are you going to write a book about yourself? And I said, you know, that's a really good question. It's not the first time people have asked me that. But I'm just so, I think that there's, a, I, you know, I love the historical stuff and I love uh, translation. So I've translated a lot of stuff. And I generally tend to write about historical figures, pioneers, people who have contributed to the growth and direction of our tradition. And I think that those guys... Uh, who had been lucky enough to come into contact with Timeless. And I think I think a lot of those guys who have lasted and made names for themselves was because they stumbled across or were led down a pathway to discover these timeless lessons and messages. And, 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 that, and that a timeless message is recognized by everybody, you know, who, who will take the time to learn it. And those things are not just, oh, I learned it, I forget it type of things. Those time, those types of principles and timeless messages are things that are life changer. Those are things that change. You know, if I said to you, I said, oh, hey, look, I'll tell you what, can you, can you give me three experience? Yeah, tell me three things in life that were life changers. You know, people go, hmm, geez, let me say, I don't, I don't know. I, I, you know, they really have, some people can't cope with it. Other people can say, oh, when, 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 my, when my mother died or when, you know, when, when I got in the car accident or when I got, you know, they, they can immediately quantify other people, not so much. So when you can, when you have a, let's call them the Pied Piper, <laughs> when you have somebody who can uh, espouse a message, uh, and he can, he or she is able to hmm, package the message in a way that is uh, understandable by that group or this gang or that level of understanding. I think that's an important person, not just, of course, the message is is universal, but you know, I mean, and I'm, I, this is just like the first thing that came to my mind, but, and I'm not a religious person at all, by the way. I'm like you. I, I you know, I'm, uh, never mind what I am spiritually. Okay. I, I won't, <laughs> I'll offend somebody if I say that. But, but you know, the thing is this, it, is if there's a message, let's say, let's say that a priest came to you and said, there's a very important message. And somebody says, you know something? I don't want to hear it. You're a priest. Or you're a rabbi or you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a, a Harney Christian or something. Yeah, I don't want to listen because they can't get over. The package that the the uh, uh, the message is wrapped yeah. in, they can't get me on the cosmetic parents. They don't hear the message, you know, and so, and that's one reason I alluded to it earlier. I was talking about Joseph Campbell's my favorite anthropologist, and I love the work of so many cultural anthropologists. But 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 uh, Campbell was quite a unique individual himself, you know, and and uh, that that one one of his 60 books he wrote is called hero with a thousand faces and everybody calls god a different name you know and whether you believe or you don't believe you know there's somewhere whether it's going to be on your deathbed begging for another few moments of air or it's early on in life depends how lucky you might be to discover that there's a higher source of power in the world other than you you know is a is a valuable uh, is a valuable lesson and what it does is it tends to open up the doors of dropping ego you know and allowing the the facet and the reality of fear uh, to understand, sorry, the fascinating and reality of what, how fear molds a person and without proper uh, education can turn people into bad, you know, sociopaths and, and, and bad people, you know, uh, and with the right guidance, uh, can, and can, can create wonderfully creative people who can, who can help, uh, educate masses of other people in a way that perhaps is not possible down another pathway. And that's why I believe so much in the historical stuff. That's why I haven't written a book about myself, because I don't think what I got is is as valuable as what has already been said by other people. And so, um, and I've got, I've got five, I actually I've got six books on the go right now, which have been in my computer for the last few years. I still haven't got around to finishing and a bunch of articles and things like that. And we were talking about this this Zoom thing. And one thing that my inability to travel around the world to come into contact with my own family, my own people of our own organization, 
is I have I've created now more online opportunities with which to help uh, meet and gather and educate our our group so that the uh, but it's it's so consuming you know it's consumed a lot of my a lot of my time that I don't have time for anything else. And I, I'm not complaining about that. It's a wonderful privilege, I think, you know, to come into contact with somebody who wants to share some of their life with you, uh, irrespective mm, of yeah. however, however brief it may be. Look, it doesn't work with everybody. I just, I just had a, you know, sadly, I just had a guy uh, quit my organization the other day in anger and go and uh, go and align himself with a guy who's actually a, a you know, an enemy of a, a, a real enemy. Of, the guys that names are not words. The guy's a convict and a sex offender and blah blah blah. And, mm. and I and I said, what a, I, what did I do wrong that you'd want to go and connect yourself with that type of person? I, I mean, I just don't get it, you know. And I, you know, it makes me reflect back upon my own uh, uh, my own fragile. Uh, posture on certain things was i was i so wrong to believe a certain thing that i maybe couldn't change the way i think so that this person was offended by something you know and, and just we'll just in principle no names but a guy wanted to do something and we had a, a policy in place and then not that policies are not meant to be broken or changed we had a policy in place and the policy was there for a reason and the policy was there largely to protect you know uh other people and uh and I said to the guy, I said, you know, you, you shouldn't have done that. And, and, and uh, you know, you, you really should have the policy is to bring it to the attention of either myself or, or the committee uh, to see if it's all right to, to do that. And if it's not, we will, we'd be more than happy to we'll support you until the cows come home, you know. And it wasn't the first time he did it. It wasn't the second time he did it. And his response to me was something like, oh, yeah. I guess it kind of clearly shows what I was up to. And I went, yeah, it does, you know. And, and I said, I'm going to come back to you later about this. And a few weeks went by. I was just so busy. I just I just had so many other priorities, you know. I mean, I had to make Stephen Covey look like a new, a new victim for a new book here, the, the ninth habit or something, you know. And uh, and by the time I finally get around, the, the guy wrote a resignation letter and and then was sporting this guy's crest from another group. And I went, so I kind of look back at myself and say, you know, there's another learning lesson. Just when you think you know it all, uh, somebody comes by and destroys that whole platform. And, and so, you know, obviously, you know, obviously not everybody sees the same thing the same way. And, and uh, you know, how can I be this old in life and not have seen that coming type of thing, you know? And, you know, and, and my wife says, we said, don't, don't beat yourself up. You know, you're not a warden. You're not, you know. You're not uh, in charge of the inmates, man. A, you know, people are free to do whatever they want. Not everybody's going to think the same way about a certain thing. And, and you know, ambition and ego and stuff like that create cause people to do certain things. Obviously, that person felt that they weren't getting enough recognition. They wanted some more. And and I said, okay, I, I back away from it. Boom, that was it. So you can edit this part out if you like, by the way. Is the therapy session over? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we've had entire off. episodes that are that are premised on me providing therapy so oh goodness yeah not right. where it's it's rare we break new i mean with 580 some episodes we don't break a lot of new ground i'm you know something i'm i'm just like you know i like like i said i actually haven't lived i haven't listened to the whole five i, I listened to four and i'm still halfway through five but i tell you this that there's so i have i don't know if it's may i ask how old you are i'm 41 does life seem to be going by pretty quickly? You know, I got a couple of years on you, and I'm going to tell you something. You know, I look at my watch. Ah, oh, God, I'm just going out for the walk on the beach now. And by the time I know it, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. I go, I get my done. Does. You know? I, it seems like that? it's going by faster as I get older, which seems to be painfully backwards. My, you know, my wife says she goes. You know, something. Your brain is like you know. You can't think like a computer because you got all this cash memory of all this shit you're thinking about all day long. You you got to let it go, man. And my and my my my, my wife is a Mrs. Holistic. You know, uh, organic this uh, yoga and Tai Chi in the morning and uh, all healthy thoughts. And you know, for her, a diet is not about food; it's about lifestyle. And you know, and and she says you gotta you know you gotta stop you know, being too serious about this stuff, you know, just, just, you know, go back and, you know, she's really pushing me to it. Just why don't you retire? You know, just, just like let everybody else do it now. Just go and go enjoy, 
the rest of your life. You're an old, you know, people live to be very old here, you know, and, and uh, they say the Okinawa has some of the oldest people in the world, you know. I was, uh, when I was up north the other day, uh, <laughs> there, there was this old group that was over, I, I was looking at a, there was a tree planted, it's a, a, it was a um, pine tree, and it was planted here in this field called Sueyoshi Park, and it was dedicated to Gichin Funakoshi, who was a pioneer of modern, one of the pioneers of modern karate. And I'd never even heard of it, let alone know it was there, right? And the old people said, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm, you know, in Japanese, I said, I'm looking at this uh, little uh, uh, monolith that's got an inscription on it, and I'm admiring this pine tree. And they said, why are you doing that? I said, well, oh, because, you know, I, I, uh, the, the person who did it, uh, I just discovered I know who he is and or was and, and his contributions. And they looked at me and they said, are you American? I went, no, I'm Canadian. I went, Oh, you're not a GI? I went, no. And they said, so you, you don't, you're not stationed here in the island? I said, oh, no, no, no. I moved here quite willingly. You know, I, and they all of a sudden, they were like, wow, you, 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 that guy's like, that guy was born in, you know, back 1867. I went, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I know who he was. I know what his country was. And they were like fascinated with me knowing, not being Okinawan. And, and then they're having a conversation. And the, the one guy says he wanted to shake my hand out. At first, I was a little bit in trouble. I said, my God, I must have shook my hand. Does he know about COVID? And anyway, I just said, for some reason, I just said, okay. And I shook his hand. And uh, and he spoke to me in a way I couldn't understand. And I and my friend was thinking, oh, he goes, oh, he's speaking Uchinaguchi. And I said, oh, Uchinaguchi, that's Hogan. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a separate language from Japanese. And I know, I know a few words, right? So I, I responded back with, I said, I said, ah, oh, men sore, hai sai. Chagenju, Icharaba Chodi, Nifi Deberu, you know, Aksameo, and, he, and they looked at me and they, and they all got up and they started doing this little dance, you know, this little Odori. And he said, okay, we got to get back to practice now. Let's take one photograph and go. And I went, practice what? And you, we, you, you and I would call it croquet. You would have the wooden hammer and they hit the ball on the field and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. They call it field baseball, by the way. And <laughs> The one, the one woman come over. She says, "You know, like I can't miss anyone." She says, "Okay, stop, go away now. We're busy." And I said, "Oh yes, Obatsan, yes, yes." <laughs> and the guy says, "You know how old she is?" And I went, "I have no idea." She goes, "She goes, she's 108 years old." And I went, "What?" And she goes, "The other guy wants to shake your hand. He's the young guy. He's only 80, uh, 80, and the other guy who wants to dance with is 95." And I said, "What? What is this club?" And he goes, "He said it's this. It's the Centennial Club." And he said, he says, you can't really be a member till you're 100 years old. And I said, you know, isn't that funny? Can you imagine? They're so active and they recite poetry and they got all this stuff on the go and they walk everywhere and they fish and they drink a lot of water. They love a little bit of awamori as well. I don't know if you know what awamori is, but that's the, uh, that's the native uh, alcohol that's associated with Okinawa. Oh, and I was very, very surprised recently to discover it's actually originally from Thailand. And that's what another story. Yeah, uh, it's, I, I believe it's made out of rice as well. I, I believe. Okay. I, don't quote me on that. Somebody will probably correct me. But Okinawa, long time ago, used to be called Rukyu, the Rukyu Kingdom. And Thailand, mm -hmm. a long time ago, used to be called Siam. And isn't it interesting that karate is a martial art that uses clenched fists, that kick people, that knee people, that hit them with the elbow. And in the old days, in the Tegumi days, also used to headbutt them as well. And they used to call it the big nine. And isn't it interesting through my historical exploration, I found that in addition to China and Korea and all the other areas throughout Southeast Asia, um, that the Rukyu kingdom traded with and that had commerce with, it also had more than 260 visits. That's, that's a group of ships, tribute ships, going down there to do business with the kingdom of Siam. And you and I both know that the kingdom of Siam had as a national pastime ever since the adopted king of the 1700s, Use Siamese boxing, and in the old days was called Mui Boran. And you know, thanks to guys like Tony John, people like that, who have brought a new way of looking at choreographing fight scenes using traditional Mui Boran uh, as fight scenes, it the, the 
the people who have eyes to be able to see beyond the the so-called ritualized classic traditions and the white uniforms and the robotic movements who are incapable of seeing this. I think when karate looks to China, they say, yes, our roots are from China. And without question, they are. But but in my historical exploration, I have found that the root Q kingdom had and, and forget weapons for a minute, okay? Which were a big, uh, which were a big part here. People say, "Oh, sure, open sure. had no weapons." And, uh, this that's just that, not even that, true. Okay? Yeah, but, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's, 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 you know, and, and in 1985, in my first book, Classical Katabona, where I destroyed that myth, by the way. But but that's another story. Talking about empty-handed traditions. Okay, the Okinawans wrestled. Uh, there's a story about Tame Tomo, I'll leave it for another time, but you know, that it was brought by Japanese here. But invariably, the wrestling comes from China, uh, to Japan and to the Rukyu Kingdom. And so, yes, that's Chinese. Uh, capturing and controlling, which was described in October 1908 by Ito's uncle as Torite uh, in his Ten Commandments, uh, is obviously uh, Chinna, which comes from China as well. Okay? And, and by the way, they're wrestling, the modern word was Suija, by the way, you know, but it goes back even much further than that. Uh, kata, as you and I know it today, whether it's Kempo or Kung Fu or North or South, internal, external, um, is, you know, the collection of uh, abstract movements in a geometrical configuration called a bunch of different names. Uh, that is the uh, exclusive domain of Chinese, uh, of, uh, of uh, arguably the, the, the political arguments between the Taoist and the Buddhist. One will say, you know, Tai Chi, Xing Yi, Bagua is soft boxing, comes from Taoism. The other stuff is hard, it's no good, it's from Shaolin, right? But that's, that's politics. The, the, so the kata that ends up in Okinawa, whether it's domestically created or imported uh, or exported from China, is from China. The only thing you cannot find anywhere else in China is closed fist impact style fighting. That's not a Chinese phenomenon. You know, Miyagi Chojin told us he closed the fist in the kata. Kian Chotoku, uh, uh, another one of the, you know, the pre-war pioneers of, main, of, of modern karate, said, yeah, the Chinese, uh, their, their preference is the open hands, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, and whether it's northern legs or southern hands, uh, that gives birth to Kempo, for example. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's not close as percussive impact. And if you look at Silat, Pujini, Kuntal, Pukalon, any of the Southeast Asian, Jakarta, mainland, from Singapore all the way down to the end of uh, the islands, uh, it's not closed fist. You know, it's trapping, checking. It's you know, it's it's a ground standard. It's you know, Salat has a, a a vibrant personality, which which comes from China, by the way. Um, but but there's only one place in Southeast Asia that you find closed fist percussive impact that kick knee and headbutt and elbow, and it's Mui Baron. And so I put forth this. Um, this thing that that what is now called karate, which is a modern term, by the way, comes from a, an earlier art called tea or te. Like, you know, like karate? Te. So the yeah. Te. And we know that the word te by itself was used to describe a fighting art. And they used to refer to it as an indigenous fighting art. There's a very, very famous quote about a guy named uh, uh, Jun Soku, who was a who was a, a lord and a statesman who lived in the north, a place called Nago, which I was just had a couple of months ago, up visiting his monument, by the way. So, uh, so well known as a father educator of youth in his day, uh, he, and he was famous for using te, sorry, karate, uh, as a mechanism for young people to help discover their own identity that he he in 1683 he quoted uh this is the famous quote he made he said it's not enough that your tay is embraced and strong but it must be reflected in your character in daily behavior and so so famous was he for using tay that they nicknamed him his name was Jun Soko. They nicknamed him Tei Jun Soko. And, and so, mm. so, you know, I used this kind of historical research as a basis to create a platform to, to delve deeper into, you know, A, presenting that to my, my colleagues so they can destroy it and say, no, that's bullshit. Or B, wow, McCarthy, you've done it again type of thing, right? And so when I said to them, you know, modern karate is the process of four individual fighting arts being fused together in a haphazard uh, 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 manner by different people at different times and for different reasons. And uh, and by the time we got to the mainland of Japan, nobody was interested in wrestling on the mainland of Japan because they've been doing jujitsu for 
500 years. And nobody was interested in Kobudo, you know, the, the weapons of Okinawa, because uh, nothing beats the sword, you know. And, uh, and But they had never seen kata before. And they had never seen closed fist impacting. Now, I know that's, a, that's, that's hard to believe, isn't it? What do you mean? They'd never seen boxing before. They'd never seen it. The first time the Japanese public ever saw a boxing match was in 1921. And two interesting, very interesting things happened for the birth of karate, by the way, in 1921. Uh, in March, on the 6th of March, 1921, the uh, crown prince who would become the emperor, that's Hirohito. Uh, in Japan, when you turn 20 years old, they, they call it sage, and it's a, it's a coming of age celebration. So, and as you do, it was a wealthy <laughs> aristocrat. Um, uh, for he was going to do something when he was 20, he turned 20 years old in 1921. And, uh, he was going to travel to Europe from Japan. And uh, the, there were two battleships that were going to convey him. And they were called the Kashima and the uh, Katori. And they were actually made by British and American shipbuilders, by the way. And they were the most powerful battleships on the planet at the time. So they felt quite secure in taking this uh, emperor to Europe to meet King George and, you know, all the royalty and so the royal orcs and all that type of stuff over there. And the commander, of the Katori, which was the lead ship, the mothership, was a guy named uh, uh, Kenwa Kana. Kana Kenwa was his name. And uh, Kana Kenwa. And he had been an Okinawan who was adopted by a Chinese uh, naval family as a young baby and brought up. And, and you know, here he's commanding the battleship now, which is the pride of the American Imperial Fleet. And it's got the, uh, you know, the, 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 the next emperor on board. So that's a, that is a, a, a privilege granted to few. And so because he was Okinawan, they decided that they were going to stop in Okinawa on the way to Europe. That's a, so anyway, anyway, so a, 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 this had never happened in Japanese history before. And so what, what the, uh, Okinawan locals did was a, I mean, in those days, the population of Okinawa was 600,000 and they had every one of them were in the port of Naha to greet the emperor when he arrived. And no one was more proud than the mother who was still alive of this boy who'd become the captain. They call him the emperor's captain. And when they sailed into town, lots of things went on. I'll spare you the details. But the, on the 6th of March, up at, up at the destroyed Shuri Castle, the, 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 you know, the spiritual uh, 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 location of the, of the culture, the formal capital, there was a karate demonstration put on, and the emperor watched it. So there's that. And at the same time, on the other side of the world, not far from you, well, it is far from you, but, but in New Jersey was the, was the World Boxing Championship uh, world titles between Jack Dempsey and a French, mm -hmm. a French savant fighter who was also a boxer, a top 10 ranked boxer named George Carpenter, or en Francais, Georges Caperture. And uh, this, uh, the reason why this fight is so famous is because it was the first time in boxing history that uh, they had ever generated a million dollar gate. And so, you know, Pathé Pacific, the blimp, you know, it was filmed. You can still see uh, footage, uh, newsreel footage of that uh, on YouTube, by the way, if you go. But anyway, the, the 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 moral of this story is this: is that that fight, the film of that fight, was shown in Japan in the summer of 1921. And what a lot of people don't know about Japan in the 1920s, you know, that don't, don't forget that's the, the 1920s. Remember that was the Roaring Twenties, and Japan had only been pulled out from the from the uh, dark ages of feudalism less than 50 years before that. You know what I mean? So they had gone from, you know, that's a Tom Cruise movie era around there type of thing. And so, so 50 years later, so in the 1920s, and Japan had become one of the biggest powers on the planet. You know, I mean, there was the, there was the, uh, the, you know, they took Formosa in 1894, 95. Then there was the, 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 you know, the 55 days at Peking, you know, the Boxers Rebellion. Uh, that's the film with Tom by the way. Um, but, you know, the, the Japanese had, a, uh, the Okinawans and the Japanese had a role in that as well. Uh, there was the Opium War issue. Then there was uh, 1904 05, Russia, Sino uh, Japanese uh, Russian War. Uh, then there was um, um, all of these things leading up to the entry of, uh, Pull a bridge to you know the Manchuria type of thing. So a lot of things that helped build militarism and 
commerce, industry, mathematics, history, uh, science, all were grabbed from uh, uh, foreign cultures and brought in to help develop Japan to become this modern, uh, uh, powerful nation. And in 1922, Japan was going to have their version of the World's Fair. You know, they had this big national athletic exhibition. And they needed, uh, they wanted to, oh my God, boxing. You know, they had tennis and baseball and all these sports and dancing and music. What they didn't have was boxing. And they wanted Jack Dempsey to come to, and Jack Dempsey didn't want to go to uh, Japan. And a guy by the name of Sasaki Gogai was a writer and wrote an article um, uh, which was published in November of 1921. And in that article, he said, we don't, we don't need them. We have our own fistic tradition, and it lies in the kingdom to the south. Why, earlier this year, the crown prince himself marveled at the, you know, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, and that's how Japanese mm. first get a peek at saying, wow, we want this. And that's what opened the door that allowed karate to come up. An otherwise unknown, really, really unknown. You know, my, my, my late master, who died back in 2013 at 95 years old, was Okinawa. And he said to me, he said, you know, Patrick, growing up, he said, nobody, nobody, let alone we Okinawans, ever thought karate would ever be, be, be anything, let alone become an Olympic sport. I mean, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, not just a, a legacy and a heritage in Okinawa. It's the pride of Okinawa, you know, that something as simple as karate would attract the attention of the emperor and, and then become uh, this worldwide, uh, you know, 120 million people practicing karate. And, and so, and so that's what gave this birth. But it's also at the same time, what, what distorted its early origins to serve uh, the military as a vehicle for us to, you know, funnel physical fitness and social conformity, which would create these, let's, for the lack of a better word, you know, really fit super conscripts who are going to go and fight a war of attrition, basically. You know, so. yeah. I don't even know how we got on that topic, but... <laughs> I, I, You know, I think this is a good place for us to put a pin in it. Because hey, hey, seven hours later, yes, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I knew going in of your your reputation for having much to say, and I love that. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of longer form conversation. I love a good conversation, and the only reason that I'm, I'm introducing a break here so that we might resume again another day is mm. that it's nine thirty. Yep. Here, I'm fading, and <laughs> I I, uh, I can imagine I'm there's a there's a comical vision in my head of me nodding off, and you not realizing it for a while. No, and no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to you. You know, it's just it's just it's, it's, it's just it's eleven thirty in the morning here for me, and you know when I oh can you hear the sirens outside? I can. When I when I leave here, uh, I have I'm actually going at two o'clock over to meet up. A friend of mine who runs the Jundo Khan Karate Dojo here in Naha, and uh, we're going to sit down, have a cup of coffee at uh, arm's length, so to speak, and uh, talk about something similar that we've been talking about. Today. <laughs> well, He's you're all warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. That was great. And listen, let me just say thank you once again to, for the opportunity to you know, yeah, chat. This, we're 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 definitely going to have you back if, if you're willing, because it's, yeah, yeah, it's sure, clear that sure. there's a lot more. There, there's a lot more. And, and you know, this gives me a ton of context for round two, where we can unpack some of these other things. In, in and if you other don't ways. mind, if you don't mind what I will do, I won't do it today because I don't have time now. Uh, somebody has been talking all morning. <laughs> uh, I will put together a little, a, a little, an, an email and send it over to you with regards to a few people who I think uh, would make please, please. Uh, great dialogue and let's have do, very valuable a contribution to the listeners and uh you know and and not and as i say you know i think there's a larger picture about you know um you know there's there's one thing about the fighting aspect of the fighting arts you know but there's another part about the living aspect you know and i think you know the, the coin a phrase you know you know uh, you know a good teacher uh teaches a person how to defend themselves or fight a great teacher teaches a person how to live you know and and mm -hmm. i first learned that quote from, from the richard chamberlain's uh I don't know if you remember the television series called Shogun, 
uh, oh gosh, I get uh, would be the, probably the would it be the late seventies or maybe very early eighties that you know Doctor Kildare, uh, Richard Chamberlain starred as uh, Anjing Sun in the he was the he was the um, uh, the pilot of the ship the, the black ships that came uh, that brought the Portuguese to uh, uh, to Japan. You know, 1543, there was the boat that landed at Tanigashima. In those days, the samurai used to kill all the foreigners when they arrived, but this time they didn't because they had guns, so they wanted to learn how to make them. And maybe on that note, we'll leave that for another <laughs> great. another conversation. Oh, I will definitely okay. email list, my list yeah. of uh, local candidates for you and, and uh, bid you a pleasant farewell. Thank you uh, very yeah. much, and best yeah. of luck. Thank, uh, thank you. This was fun. This was fun. You 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 <laughs> opened a lot of doors in my head. You know, there, there are a lot of dots Thanks. to connect here, and uh, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to this a couple times. I think. Thanks for being so gracious. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Woo! That was a bit of a marathon, and just like at the end of running a marathon, we're feeling it, and it's a good thing because the amount of information, the knowledge that was dropped on today's episode, the things that just made my mind blow up a little bit as I thought about them. Pretty extensive. It's clear to me that McCarthy Sensei deserves the reputation that he has for being so profound in the work that he has done. And I look forward to connecting with him again, having him on the show again, and hopefully getting to, to meet up at some point in real life in the future. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your time. If you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find videos, links, social media, pictures, and more. Not just for this episode, but for everyone we've ever made. If you're down to support us in all of our work, you have a few options. You can visit the store at whistlekick.com and use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Or leave a review in your podcast player, buy one of our many books on Amazon, or help out the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. If you see somebody out in the wild wearing a whistle cake shirt, maybe a hat, be sure to say hello. If you have guest suggestions or other feedback, let me know. Jeremy at whistlecake.com. Our social media accounts get a lot of activity, and you can find us everywhere you might think of at Whistlekick. And that's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Whistlekick.